My name is Jonas, and this happened to me in October of 2012. For the past five years, I've lived off the grid in a remote cabin tucked deep within the Olympic National Forest in Washington State. This place, it's a damp, green labyrinth of old-growth trees and moss-covered rocks. Beautiful, and a little eerie on foggy days. I like it that way. Solitude keeps me sane. I'm out on patrol when I first hear it, a sound unlike anything I've ever encountered. It begins as a low, chittering growl, echoing through the thick underbrush on the mountainside above me. My woodsman instincts kick in, bear? Cougar gone rabid? I unsling the shotgun strapped to my back, ready for the worst-case scenario. I've dealt with aggressive predators before, but this sound sends an unnatural prickle down my spine. Minutes pass, and the chittering intensifies, interspersed with what sounds like hissing. And something else, a wet, rasping noise that puts my teeth on edge. Whatever it is, it's coming closer. I decide to get the hell out of there. I radio back to base camp for backup, mentioning an unknown animal for the official record. My gut tells me this isn't a normal situation. I'm halfway back down the trail when something massive barrels through the trees above me, shattering branches and sending birds scattering. It lands on the path, blocking my way, a nightmare given form. It rears up at least eight feet tall, its skeletal frame barely covered by taut, sickly gray skin. Long, bony arms end in impossibly long curved claws, dripping with some unknown viscous fluid. The creature's head is stretched tight over a grinning skull, with fleshy remnants clinging in grotesque parody of a human face. Its empty eye sockets seem to bore into me, burning with hunger and a predatory intelligence that chills me to the core. My heart slams against my ribs. Shotgun up, I fire off a warning shot, more out of desperation than strategy. The sound echoes through the silent forest, but the creature barely flinches. It lets out an ear-splitting shriek, part hiss, part enraged roar. The fetid stench of rotting flesh washes over me, nearly making me gag. Panic wars with hard-won training. I need to buy time until backup arrives. Another shot rings out, this time aimed at the creature's chest. A spray of black ichor erupts from the wound, but it doesn't fall. It shrieks again, then charges. I scramble backwards, firing blindly. There's nowhere to run in the dense undergrowth, no way to escape. I stumble, crashing to the forest floor. The shotgun clatters away, lost amidst the ferns. Despair claws at my throat. This is it. This is where I die, torn apart by some monstrous thing from the darkest corners of the woods. Then, another gunshot rings out, different caliber, echoing through the trees. The creature jerks back, screeching in pain. More shots follow, and something heavy thuds behind me. I scramble to my feet, searching for my shotgun. The creature stumbles, clutching its side where its exposed ribs now gleam white. I see its skull face turn and those empty eye sockets fall upon a figure standing with a rifle half-hidden by the trees. The figure's a woman, I realize, tall and lean, with a long braid of auburn hair. She's wearing worn camo gear, and an array of what looks like military-grade knives is strapped to her chest. Where did she come from? Another hunter, out here alone? She raises her rifle again, her motions sure and practiced. I recognize that rifle a custom job, not something a civilian would typically own. She's no ordinary hunter. 
another shot. The creature thrashes, then falls, a wet, gurgling sound escaping its ruined throat. Black ichor pools around its lifeless body, the stench making my stomach churn. My would-be rescuer emerges from the trees, approaching with a cautious precision that suggests this ain't her first rodeo. Her gaze sweeps over me, clinical and assessing. You okay? she asks. Voice is low, rough-edged, with an accent I can't quite place. I manage a weak nod, my throat too constricted to speak. With a few deft movements, she reloads her rifle. Her eyes never leave the creature's body. Don't move. It might not be dead. After what feels like an eternity, she holsters her rifle and approaches the body. She prods it with the barrel the same way I have seen seasoned hunters do with a downed deer. Finally, she stands, a grim expression on her face. It's over, she announces, her voice flat. Then, fixing me with a piercing gaze, what the hell were you thinking, engaging that thing alone? My answer comes out as a choked mumble. Something about standard procedure, radioing in the sighting, she cuts me off with a scoff. You think procedure keeps you alive out here? She shakes her head in clear disgust. There's things in these woods your procedures don't cover. Things your little ranger training never prepared you for. Her words unnerve me more than the monstrous creature. Shame burns hot under my skin, the truth of my inexperience laid bare. Listen, she continues, her voice softening slightly. I, I saw your radio call. Seemed strange, so I came to check it out. Glad I did. Gratitude washes over me, followed by curiosity. Who are you? She hesitates, then her lips twist into a wry half-smile. Name's Anya and I ain't your average hiker. A beat of silence, then, I hunt the things that hunt us. Finally, the pieces click into place. She's one of them, the whisper stories told around campfires, sightings by lone hunters that are chalked up to exhaustion or tall tales. People who know these woods hide a darker truth. I start to stammer out a question a plea for some sort of explanation, but Anya cuts me off again. Not here, not now. She points towards the fallen creature. That thing, it won't be alone for long. They sense their own. She slings her rifle over her shoulder. We gotta move. With that cryptic command, she turns and disappears back into the dense foliage. I hesitate for a split second, then scramble after her. My ranger instincts tell me this is insane, but self-preservation and a desperate hunger for knowledge outweigh them. We trek for hours, following an unmarked trail known only to Anya. My questions burn in my throat, but the look in her eyes keeps them at bay. At a hidden clearing, she stops. A dilapidated airstream trailer sits nestled between the trees, camouflaged by vines and moss. Inside, it's surprisingly well-equipped, maps with strange markings, an arsenal of weaponry, and stacks of worn books with titles about forgotten lore and ancient legends. It's a hunter's haven, but a hunter of a very different kind. Anya finally addresses the elephant in the room. That creature, it's called a Wendigo. A hungry spirit, twisted and trapped in a monstrous form. What you saw is just the beginning. Her eyes gleam with intensity. There's more, Jonas. Much more lurking in the shadows. My mind reels. Folklore and myth made terrifyingly real. 
Anya explains, her voice a chilling monotone. Wendigos, skinwalkers, ancient evils, creatures most believe exist only around late-night campfires. She has a name for everything that's been dismissed as the stuff of nightmares. The rest of the day is a blur. Anya trains me basic survival against the unknown, how to load and use her specialized weapons, and rudimentary tracking techniques. She doesn't sugarcoat the danger, her words laced with a grim fatalism that mirrors my own mounting dread. When night falls, the forest comes alive with sounds that raise the hair on my neck. Anya sits by the flickering oil lamp, one eye on the darkness outside, seemingly waiting for something. The air crackles with tension. Then, a howl pierces the night, long and mournful. Humanoid, yet somehow off. Anya's knuckles whiten around the hilt of a wicked-looking blade sheathed at her waist. They're here, she whispers. More howls answer, joined by the sound of snapping branches and rustling undergrowth. Shapes flicker in the darkness, drawn by the scent of their fallen kin. Anya stands, every line of her body taut with readiness. You ready to fight, Jonas, she asks over her shoulder, the barest hint of a challenge in her voice. The ranger in me is long dead, replaced by a terrified but determined survivor. I pick up a spare rifle, my hands trembling slightly. As I'll ever be. Anya flashes a grim smile. Then welcome to the hunt. The ensuing battle is a chaotic blur of claws, snarling maws, and gunfire echoing through the night. Anya moves with unnatural speed and precision, a whirlwind of blades and fury. I fight clumsily at first, but adrenaline fuels me, and desperation makes me learn fast. By dawn, the clearing is littered with monstrous bodies, the stench of black ichor thick in the air. We're both wounded, exhausted, but alive. For now. In the aftermath, Anya sits slumped against the trailer, the first unguarded moment I've seen from her. For a while, the only sounds are our ragged breaths and the dripping of blood. Finally, she speaks, her voice raw. There's no going back to your old life, Jonas. Not after this. She turns, her gaze holding mine. You chose to fight. Now, you choose the path. You stay, we hunt these things together. Or you walk away, and forget everything you saw. Her voice softens. No judgment either way. This kind of life, it breaks a person. The life I had is in ruins. The safe solitude of my cabin, my sense of purpose, all devoured by the monstrous reality revealed in that clearing. But there's also a grim determination rising within me, a thirst for answers even mixed with terror. I think of those empty eye sockets, the hunger I glimpsed in them. I think of whatever else is lurking out there, preying on the unwitting. I make my choice. I stay. My name is Wyatt, and this happened to me in September of 2014. I've spent most of my life working as a wildlife ranger in Glacier National Park, Montana. It's rugged country, a haven for elk, bear, and the occasional overly ambitious hiker. I've seen my share of nature's beauty and nature's fury, but nothing ever prepared me for this. I'm on a routine patrol near the Canadian border, a part of the park so remote it sees only a handful of visitors a year. Late afternoon, I spot something strange on a ridgeline, a flash of sickly white against the dark green of the pines. Figuring it's a lost mountain goat, 
I take a detour to investigate. Big mistake. As I get closer, I realize it's no goat. It's massive, at least nine feet tall, impossibly thin, with long, bony limbs. Its skin is taut over its protruding ribs, a gruesome shade of pale that makes it blend almost seamlessly with the rocks. In its head, my stomach churns. It's a skull, mostly, stretched over with a thin layer of translucent skin. The eyes are milky white, clouded and unseeing, but it still feels like the empty sockets are staring right through me. It stands motionless at first, as if sizing me up. I freeze, hand inching towards the pistol holstered at my hip. Something deep in my gut is screaming at me to run, but rational thought wrestles back control. My years of training kick in, assess the situation, identify the threat. This ain't no bear or cougar. Then, it moves. It's not a walk, not a run, but some ghastly cross between the two, a jerky, twitching lope that's unnervingly fast for its size. Before I can fully process what's happening, it's covered half the distance between us. I draw my pistol and fire off a couple of warning shots. It falters for a second, and I glimpse a flicker of confusion. No, that can't be right. But it stops, tilting its skull-like head to the side curiously. My heart's pounding like a war drum now, but there's a sliver of hope. Maybe I can scare it off, make it back to my truck, radio for help. It lets out a screech, like a rusty hinge magnified a thousand times. That screech tears through my hopeful thoughts, and pure animal terror floods through me. I fire off another shot, aiming for center mass this time. The bullet slams into the creature's chest, knocking it off balance. But it doesn't fall. It stumbles, an ugly hole marring its gaunt torso but that damned screeching only grows louder, filled with fury. It's relentless, charging again. I fire shot after shot, emptying the magazine, but it barely seems to slow down. Panic takes over. I turn and run, blindly, scrambling down the rocky slope. Behind me, the creature gains, its screeches echoing off the cliffs. A fallen log blocks my path. I stumble, sprawling face first into the dirt. I flail around for my pistol but can't find it. Must have dropped it when I fell. I scramble to my feet, but it's too late. The creature towers over me, a grotesque shadow against the fading light. It raises one impossibly long arm its elongated fingers ending in needle-sharp claws. The milky eyes that look dull from a distance are now inches from my own, blazing with terrifying intelligence. A scream tears from my throat as its claws rake across my back. White-hot pain blinds me, and I'm vaguely aware of being lifted into the air. My world narrows to the dripping sound of my own blood and the creature's ragged breathing, a foul mix of wet earth and decay. Then, a gunshot rings out. Not mine, a higher caliber, a rifle. The creature jerks, dropping me roughly to the ground. I scramble back, heart pounding, as it whips its head around, searching for the source of the attack. It spots the newcomer, a young woman with fiery red hair, a rifle braced on a fallen tree trunk. She must be another ranger or a lone hunter. Her face is set in grim determination, and she fires again and again, each shot hitting its mark. The creature howls in pain, thrashing. It tries to charge the woman, but the relentless gunfire keeps it pinned down. I take my chance, scrambling past the chaotic scene, 
stumbling towards my truck. My back feels like it's on fire with pain, but adrenaline pushes me forward. I never look back, even as the creature's screeches turn into gurgling sounds. I slam the truck into gear, tires spitting gravel as I tear down the logging road, not stopping until I reach the nearest ranger station. In the frantic aftermath, my rescuer is nowhere to be found. My story about a skeletal monster is met with a mix of disbelief and pitying looks, shock, probably. I'm treated for my wounds, physical and mental. My official report paints a picture of a bear attack, maybe a rogue grizzly. But I know what I saw, and my rescuer knows it too, whoever she was. Months later, I can still feel the phantom touch of those skeletal claws, still hear the echo of its death rattles. I resign from the park service. Glacier will always be my backyard, but it's not my sanctuary anymore. Some nights, I swear I catch a glimpse of sickly white in the shadows at the edge of my property, and the lingering smell of rot makes my dog whimper and slink under the bed. I sell my old cabin up in the mountains and buy a tiny condo in a bustling town, figuring crowds are the best defense against unseen predators. It doesn't work. The nightmares are relentless, and I wake up in a cold sweat more often than not, phantom claws raking across my skin. Whispers about my breakdown reach me. The other rangers, once my friends, now look at me with a mixture of pity and unease. I become a local legend, the crazy ranger who saw a monster. Kids taunt me on the streets imitating the creature's screech. It's a small town, and I'm branded for life. One morning, on a walk to clear my head, I see a small, hand-lettered poster stapled to a telephone pole, missing person Amelia Walsh. The faded photo shows a young woman with familiar fiery red hair. My blood runs cold. It's her, my rescuer. The guilt eats at me. I could have helped the investigation, maybe pointed them in the right direction. But now, Amelia's disappearance is just another unsolved mystery added to the growing whispers about the shadowed corners of Glacier National Park. I try to get back to a normal life. I take a dead-end job in a hardware store, stocking shelves and enduring the occasional mockery from customers who hear the whispers about me. Days turn into weeks, weeks into a bleak monotony. I start drinking heavily, self-medicating against the constant fear coiling in my gut. Then, one rainy evening, a battered truck pulls up to the curb outside my condo. A man gets out, tall and broad-shouldered, with a weathered face and piercing blue eyes. He approaches, and a knot forms in my stomach. Wyatt, he asks, his voice gruff. I stare. Do I know you? Name's Jensen. Amelia's father. He holds my gaze, and I can see the unspoken accusation there. It's my fault. I should have done more when she disappeared. I open my mouth to apologize, but he cuts me off. No, he says, his voice surprisingly gentle. Amelia would never blame you. That thing took her, not you. But she told me what happened, what you both saw out there. He hesitates, then looks me dead in the eye. She thought you might be ready to hunt it down. Hope, a tiny flicker I thought long gone, sparks within me. Maybe there's a chance for some sort of redemption, a chance to stop that creature before it claims another victim. I find my voice. Where do I sign up? Jensen nods grimly. Over the next few weeks, a plan forms. 
He's been tracking that thing's movements for years ever since it took Amelia. Has a network of hunters, survivalists, fellow victims, people touched by the darkness lurking in those mountains. We gear up, rifles, specialized ammo, enough supplies for weeks out in the wilds. The faces assembled are hardened, marked by loss. There's a haunted look in their eyes, a shared thirst for vengeance. As we head back into the mountains, an unsettling feeling crawls over me. Am I walking into a suicide mission? The creature seems unstoppable, an embodiment of primal terror. But the thought of it still out there, preying on the unwary, fuels my resolve. This ends now, one way or another. We track the creature for days, following a trail of gruesome kills and chilling whispers from remote townsfolk. We find its lair, a cave with remnants of its victims scattered across the floor, and set a trap. I'm the bait, the one it knows and craves. The wait is agonizing. Shadows play tricks on the eyes, every rustling leaf sounds like the creature approaching. Then, on the third night, I see it emerge from the darkness. Its milky eyes fixate on me and its skull-like face stretches in a grotesque grin. The trap springs shut, pinning the creature down with reinforced steel nets. It thrashes and screeches, a primal sound filled with fury and frustration. The hunters converge, rifles raised, their eyes burning with determination. A gunshot rings out, then another, and another. The creature's screeches turn into wet gurgles. I watch, rooted to the spot, as it finally goes still, its mangled body twitching in the dirt. We burn the corpse, making sure nothing remains of the horror. In the aftermath, there's no celebration, no sense of victory. Just a hollow feeling mixed with a strange sense of peace. The hunters disperse going back to their solitary quests in the shadows. As for me, I don't return to the town. Leave the condo, the job, the whispers all behind. The wilderness calls me again, but with a different purpose now. I know there are other things like that creature out there, lurking in the forgotten corners of our world. And I'll be there, a solitary figure in the darkness, keeping watch. My life won't ever be normal again, but maybe, just maybe, it can make a difference. My name is Caden, and this happened to me in August of 2014. I was a park ranger in Alaska's Wrangell St. Elias National Park, a sprawling wilderness that could swallow a manhole. Figured after some rough years in the military, a quiet life checking permits and counting bear sightings was about as good as it could get. Boy, was I wrong. Routine patrol on the far reaches of the park, that's all this was supposed to be. Days spent hiking remote trails with only the mountains for company. On this particular day, the trail snaked through a dense stand of spruce, the air thick with that damp forest smell. Sun barely filtered through the canopy, casting long shadows that danced with the swaying branches. Place had a primeval feel, the kind that prickles the hairs on the back of your neck. Then I found them. Two campers, their tent a shredded ruin. Gear scattered everywhere sleeping bags torn like they had been ripped apart by something with claws. A half-eaten deer carcass was dragged into the undergrowth, a gruesome piece of unfinished business. What worried me most were the footprints. Too large to be a grizzly, misshapen in a way that sent a shiver down my spine. I radioed it in, my voice tight. Something was out there, something the guidebooks hadn't warned about. 
Ranger HQ dismissed it as a bear that got lucky one night, told me to double back and relocate the campers, protocol for a surprise snack attack. But I knew in my gut, this was different. Spent the next few days combing those woods with a gnawing unease that only intensified with each passing hour. Signs of the creature were everywhere, half-devoured kills, those monstrous footprints, and a strange, acrid smell that clung to the air around its hunting grounds. Every rustle of leaves had me clutching my rifle a little tighter, every snapped twig sent a surge of adrenaline through my veins. I started leaving bits of bait, packaged jerky, open cans of fish, anything with a strong scent to draw it out, to catch a glimpse of just what the hell I was dealing with. Then, late one evening, I heard it. A low, rumbling growl that vibrated through the trees, followed by a shriek that echoed through the valley, cutting off abruptly with an unnatural finality. It was coming from the direction of the bait. With foolish curiosity outweighing common sense, I crept towards the sound. When I reached a small clearing, my blood ran cold. The bait was gone, replaced by the fresh carcass of a caribou, half-eaten. And crouched beside the remains, was the creature. Moonlight caught its form, a grotesque silhouette against the deepening dusk. It was massive, easily twice the size of a grizzly, with long, skeletal limbs and a skull-like head adorned with a set of enormous antlers. But it was the eyes that haunted me, glowing orbs of pure yellow that seemed to burn into my soul. The creature turned, those piercing eyes locking on mine. I froze. For a heart-stopping moment, we simply stared at each other, predator and prey sizing each other up. Then it slowly rose to its full height, a guttural snarl rumbling deep in its throat. I snapped out of my trance. It was charging, an unstoppable force of bone and rage. I raised my rifle and fired, shot after shot echoing through the stillness. I aimed for center mass, but the creature seemed to shrug off the bullets like a mere annoyance. I stumbled back, tripping over a tree root, landing hard on the forest floor. The creature was closing the distance, impossibly fast. I scrambled to reload, hands shaking. I had one shot left, one chance. I raised the rifle trying to steady my ragged breaths. Just as it lunged, I squeezed the trigger. The blast boomed through the clearing. The creature shrieked, its glowing eyes widening in shock. It staggered back, clutching its chest. I could see the damage now, a gaping wound oozing inky black fluid. It let out another enraged roar, then turned and crashed off into the trees with shocking agility despite its injury. Silence fell like a shroud. I sat there trembling, heart pounding against my ribs. It took an eternity to catch my breath and force myself to my feet. The battle was over for now, but the war was barely beginning. That creature was wounded, not dead and something told me it wouldn't take kindly to being shot. The gunshot's echo hadn't even faded when my radio crackled. It's Wilkes, a fellow ranger, his voice a tense whisper. Caden? Buddy, you there? I heard shots, what the hell's happening? His campsite was just a mile further down the trail. Damn it. I forgot about him in the chaos. Wilkes, stay put. Something's out here, big, dangerous, not a damn bear. I yelled into the radio, voice hoarse. Get yourself barricaded, I'm on my way. I bolted through the trees, rifle clutched tight. When I reached his camp, my heart sank. Another scene of carnage torn tent, 
shredded supplies, and the same monstrous footprints pressed into the muddy ground. But no Wilkes. Dread washed over me. Had the creature doubled back? Taken him by surprise? I called his name, voice cracking. Nothing but the chilling silence of the Alaskan backcountry. I followed the tracks, a desperate search against the encroaching darkness. They stopped abruptly at the edge of a ravine. I edged closer, stomach churning. Below, in the depth shrouded by twilight, Wilkes lay sprawled on the rocks, his form horribly twisted, surrounded by a pool of crimson. He was gone, no question. The grief and guilt were almost unbearable, a man lost, on my watch. And a chilling realization crept in. I wasn't just hunting this creature. It was hunting me. Days turned into a haunted blur. I stalked those woods like a phantom, following a trail of blood and death as the creature left the path of destruction in its wake. Word filtered out, and a task force was scrambled, seasoned hunters, armed men, folks determined to end this monstrous reign. But the creature was cunning. It ambushed them one by one, leaving a trail of bodies for me to find. I started making mistakes, rash decisions fueled by rage. The creature always seemed one step ahead, leading me deeper into the unforgiving wilderness, blurring the line between hunter and hunted. It was toying with me. One night, alone by a flickering campfire, I stared into the flames and wrestled with a truth I couldn't deny. The only way to end this was to offer myself as bait. Put myself in its path and hope to hell I was better prepared this time. The plan was reckless, some might say suicidal. I stockpiled supplies, left a detailed map for any search party that might follow, and vanished into the green depths. Each step might be my last. Yet with every mile, a grim determination hardened within me. I found a high bluff, perfect for a final stand camouflaged myself, rifle primed and loaded. For three agonizing days I waited, senses straining against the oppressive silence. Every shadow held the potential for death. But it only appeared as the last rays of the fourth day began to fade. It stalked into view, moving with that same terrifying grace. The wounds from our last encounter had partially healed, leaving grotesque scars across its skeletal form. But those eyes, they burned with a chilling intensity, a single-minded thirst for revenge. This time, there was no ambush. It simply padded out of the undergrowth and stared, daring me to make the first move. I raised the rifle, the creature silhouetted against the blood-red sunset. The shot echoed through the wilderness, a final, defiant roar. It jerked, a bloom of black spreading across its chest. It shrieked, not in pain, but in fury. And then, the charge began. I fired again and again, each shot finding its mark. It faltered, stumbled, but kept coming. Closer and closer, until I could see the gnashing teeth, smell the fatted musk. My gun clicked empty, and a wave of despair crashed over me. This was it. But just as it lunged, a blinding beam of light split the darkness, followed by another, then another. Headlights. Backup had arrived attracted by the gunfire, and not a moment too soon. The startled creature let out a startled yelp as spotlights pinned it in their glare. Rifle shots rang out, a cacophony of sound. It stumbled, roared, and thrashed against its unseen attackers, but it was too late. The barrage was relentless. Finally, with a last shuddering sigh, 
the beast collapsed to the ground. The forest fell silent once more. The hunters warily approached, their guns trained on the creature's corpse. I just stood there, trembling, unable to process what had just transpired. The aftermath is a mess of red tape and unanswered questions. The creature's body was taken for study, disappearing into government labs, its origins left frustratingly vague. They call it an aberration, a fluke of nature. But we who've seen it, who've faced its malevolence, know better. Some think me a hero. Some see a man broken by the wilderness, haunted by what he's seen. They whisper that the mountains still hold secrets the creature took with it to the grave. And maybe they're right. Out here, the world feels a little less certain, the shadows a little deeper. I never went back to being a ranger. Couldn't stomach the quiet trails knowing what lurks in the unexplored corners. I took up residence in a small cabin far from that godforsaken park, trying to find a peace that still eludes me. Nights are the worst. That's when the dreams come, the screams of my fallen comrades, the gleam of those haunting yellow eyes. I keep a rifle by the bed, old habits die hard. Because out there, under the vast Alaskan sky, something stirs within the wilds. And I'll be damned if it ever catches me unprepared again. My name is Caleb, and this happened to me in September of 2010. I spent most of my life working as a logging contractor up in the Cascades of northern Washington. Remote country, the kind where towns are few and far between, and the locals give any outsider the side eye. My crew knows those woods better than most, but even we ain't prepared for what comes next. I'm overseeing the rigging for a big spruce, a tricky one, leaning precariously over a ravine. We're almost ready to drop it when Russell, my best hand and a guy who doesn't spook easy, lets out a startled yelp. I turn, expecting a wasp's nest or another bear, but he's staring into the trees above us. What in hell? He starts, his voice hushed. I follow his gaze. There, clinging to a high branch with unnatural agility, is the biggest damn coyote I've ever seen. At least, that's what I think it is at first. Things too lanky, its movements too jerky and fluid. And those eyes, they glow with a strange yellow light under the canopy of leaves. I raise my binoculars for a better look. That's when I see it clearly. It's no coyote. The skin stretches tight over a too-thin frame, hair patchy and mange-ridden. Its ribs protrude sharply, but the way it moves, it suggests a predatory strength belying its sickly appearance. The skull-like head swivels, and those eerie eyes lock directly onto mine. A chill crawls down my spine. Shoot it! Russell whispers frantically, fumbling for his rifle. No, I counter, my voice barely above a mutter. Something, something tells me shooting it would be a bad idea. Let's quietly pack up and leave. That thing can have this damn tree. Russell hesitates, but the unease has spread to the rest of the crew. We hastily gather our gear, the unsettling feeling of being watched prickling the back of my neck. It gets worse. Days turn into a week, and that feeling of being observed doesn't leave. I spot the creature lurking near camp, hearing human snarls echoing through the woods at night. The crew's on edge, guys threatening to quit if I don't deal with the situation. I call on a professional tracker, figure maybe it's some new kind of invasive predator I don't know how to handle. 
the tracker, old grizzled mountain man named Wyatt, arrives two days later, weathered face lined with concern when I tell him what we've been dealing with. He examines the tracks I show him, then shakes his head grimly. Ain't no animal I ever seen, he says quietly, but I recognize the signs. We ain't dealing with the natural world, son. He refuses to tell me more that night. In the flickering campfire light, surrounded by the vast darkness of the forest, he spins a tale I can barely believe. Ancient legends the local tribes apparently still whisper about, stories of malevolent spirits trapped in tormented, half-animal forms. He tells me of the Wendigo, a creature born from starvation and desperation, an insatiable hunger wrapped in a wasting body. The next morning, Wyatt leaves to scout the area, promising to return at nightfall with a plan. He never comes back. Night descends with an oppressive heaviness. The guys are terrified, convinced the Wendigo took Wyatt. Russell, always the hothead, advocates arming up and hunting the damn thing down. He's got a few others on his side, the fear twisting into bloodlust. I try to talk sense into them, my mind reeling from Wyatt's tales. These woods have suddenly turned alien, and I know in my gut those guns will be useless against a creature born of old magic. Before I can settle the argument, a blood-curdling howl echoes through the darkness, closer than ever before. The Wendigo's call is guttural, despairing, and full of a ravenous need that cuts through me like a knife. Another howl, and another, answering from different locations. The crew panics in earnest. They're out there. Russell whimpers, his eyes wide with terror. And they know we're here. Then, a flash of emaciated bone and grayish fur lunges from the shadows, hitting the makeshift barricade surrounding our camp with impossible force. The wood splinters, and then, chaos. The beast crashes through the flimsy protection, a whirlwind of claws and teeth. The crew scatters, their screams swallowed by the hungry darkness of the forest. I reach for my rifle, more out of desperation than hope, but it's knocked from my hands as another creature barrels into the camp. I scramble backwards, my eyes desperately scanning the chaotic scene. The creatures descend upon the rest of my men, their shrieks fading into sickening, wet sounds. My mind races, run, fight, die. The paralyzing weight of despair threatens to consume me. Suddenly, a figure emerges from the darkness, a tall man wielding a strange, intricately carved staff. He moves with uncanny swiftness, his blows accompanied by crackling bursts of energy that make the monstrous creatures recoil. He's a blur of motion, a lone defender against the encroaching horde. Who is he? One of the creatures lunges at him, but with a flick of his wrist, it explodes into a cloud of foul-smelling mist. Momentarily emboldened, I grab an axe from the ground and stagger to my feet. Over here! I shout at him, more a plea than a command. His gaze snaps in my direction, and I see his eyes, fierce and bright blue, burning with a chilling determination. He throws back his head and unleashes a primal cry, the sound resonating through the forest. To my astonishment, the creatures hesitate, their ear-splitting howls morphing into confused whimpers. Taking advantage of their momentary disarray, the stranger sprints towards me. Caleb, isn't it, he shouts, his voice rough and somehow familiar even in the midst of the chaos. We need to get the hell out of here. His voice jolts something in my memory. Wyatt. Somehow, he survived his encounter and he knows my name. Wyatt. 
I thought, how? Explanations later. He grabs my arm, yanking me with surprising strength. Can you run? Numbly, I nod, my body fueled by pure adrenaline now. We cut through the surrounding vegetation, the monstrous howls fading behind us. We don't stop until we reach a clearing where a battered pickup truck is hidden amongst the trees. Wyatt throws open the door and shoves me inside. As he fires up the engine, he grunts, hold on. This is gonna be a bumpy ride. The truck lurches into motion, crashing through the undergrowth with reckless abandon. Behind us, the chorus of enraged howls starts up again. Wyatt glances at me, sweat cutting trails through the dirt on his face. You did good back there, Caleb. Most men would have crumbled. But it doesn't feel like I did anything but survive. My men are gone, slaughtered by, by things that shouldn't exist. We reach a rutted logging road. Wyatt slams the truck into gear, pushing the old engine to its limits. Where are we going? I manage to choke out. Safe haven, he answers tersely. Got a cabin, well warded. They won't find us there. Hours pass in a blur of adrenaline and encroaching despair. When we finally reach the cabin, a ramshackle structure tucked deep in the woods, the first rays of dawn are painting the sky. Inside, it's surprisingly cozy. An ancient-looking book with worn leather bindings lies open on a table, strange symbols scrawled across its pages. How did you survive? I ask, my voice cracking. I barely have the strength to stand. Wyatt sighs. That creature, it let me go. They sometimes do that, toy with their prey, prolong the hunt. He shakes his head wearily. It's a game to them, Caleb. We're nothing but meat. His words echo the desolate emptiness I feel. I think of Russell, always quick with a joke and a loyal worker. The others, faces now lost to the swirling fog of fear and bloodshed. It's my fault. I brought them here. Wyatt sees the guilt contorting my face. Don't carry that. You couldn't have known. He pours a steaming mug of something bitter from a kettle on a wood-burning stove and hands it to me. Drink. You need it. Days turn into weeks. Wyatt teaches me everything he knows about these, these Wendigos. He warns me about more creatures out there, things that make the Wendigo look almost tame. He teaches me how to make wards, how to defend myself. But my sleep is haunted by the sounds of my men dying. He tells me I can go back to civilization, run from this. But the thought of those creatures out there, hunting the unsuspecting, it makes my blood run cold. One day, under a sky-threatening rain, Wyatt straps on his worn backpack and slings a battered rifle over his shoulder. Where are you going? I ask, the words catching in my throat. To end this, he replies, his eyes burning with a grim determination. Those things took enough, Caleb. Time to make them pay. And with that, he vanishes into the unforgiving wilderness. I never see him again. His disappearance leaves a void just as chilling as the lingering presence of the forest monsters. I stay in the cabin, the book of ancient lore becoming my constant companion. It's not a life, it's a solitary crusade against the darkness. I leave the cabin only to hunt, to set traps I learn from the book. Sometimes, I hear those inhuman howls in the distance, a chilling reminder that the hunters are always out there.
but I'll be ready. I made a choice that night in the forest, a choice forged in blood and terror. Now, I am the hunter. My name is Caleb, and this happened to me in September of 2011. I spent a good chunk of my adult life working as a backcountry guide around Yellowstone National Park. I know those woods like the lines on my palm. The tourists see the pretty stuff, geysers and bears and postcard views. Me, well, I've seen the other side of the park, the wild and lonely corners where nature gets dark and unforgiving. This particular trip, I'm guiding a couple on a multi-day hike, showing them a side of Yellowstone most folks never see. They're experienced outdoorsa types, Erica and Ben, both fit and loaded with expensive gear. City dwellers, though, with money to burn and not a whole lot of practical sense. First day out was fine, despite Erica's constant complaints and Ben trying to make up for her with forced cheerfulness. The second day though, that's when things start getting weird. It starts with the birds. Normally, the forest is alive with sound. That morning, there's nothing. And it's not just the birds gone silent, even the insects seem to have vanished. The forest feels empty, like it's holding its breath. That prickle on the back of my neck I've learned to trust over the years starts tingling. We push on because Erica won't hear of turning back. We hike until dusk starts to settle in, finding a clearing near a stream to make camp. Ben sets about making a fire while I pitch the tents. I'm heading towards the tree line to relieve myself when I see it. There, half hidden in the shadows, is a carcass. A deer, but torn open like an angry kid with a present. The meat is ripped off the bones, the whole thing a gory mess. That in itself isn't too worrying, wolves, cougars, they all leave kills. No, what bothers me is the way it's been killed, the sheer violence of it. I don't say anything to Erica or Ben. No need to spook them, and I've got a hunch about this anyway. We eat a tense dinner the silence of the forest a heavy weight. That night, after they turn in, I keep watch, rifle loaded and ready. Nothing happens, and when dawn breaks, I'm both relieved and more than a little confused. The third day is when things truly go south. We're making our way along a narrow trail, single file, when Erica, who's leading, suddenly screams. I rush forward, heart pounding, to find her staring in horror at something on the ground. It's a park ranger's hat, the kind I wear. There's blood smeared on it, and what looks like, bite marks. I scan the tree line, every nerve on edge. Where in hell did this come from? My mind races, trying to figure out if it's a bear attack but bears don't normally drag their kills. It doesn't add up. Something's out here, Ben says, his voice low and tight. Erica starts whimpering, and I feel a familiar surge of anger tinged with responsibility. I should have turned us back yesterday, damn it. We need to get out of here, get to open ground where whatever's out there can't sneak up on us. No more narrow trails, we'll bushwhack our way to the nearest ranger station and radio for help. I explain the plan, trying to sound calm despite the gnawing unease in my gut. The terrain quickly turns against us, dense underbrush, fallen trees, everything slows our progress. Ben volunteers to take the lead, hacking a path with a machete, and I bring up the rear. I'm constantly scanning the woods, every rustle of leaves making me jump. Then, it happens. Erica shrieks. 
I spin around in time to see a blur of movement, a flash of sickly pale skin disappearing into the trees behind Erica. It was tall, too tall, and impossibly thin. Its fingers end in jagged claws, flecked with blood. What the hell was that? Ben yells, the machete raised defensively. Erica's sobbing hysterically now. My mind scrambles for explanations. A feral person? An escaped mental patient? None of it fits, not really. Then, a chilling memory surfaces, stories from old-timers about a creature in the woods, something monstrous. No, can't be. We keep moving, fear propelling us now. In every few minutes, that flash of movement in the periphery of our vision. Just glimpses, but I'm starting to understand. It's circling us, stalking us like prey. The sun is dipping low when we burst out of the forest and into a clearing. Ahead, in the fading light, stands a ranger station, a beacon of hope. Relief washes through me. We made it. But then, rising from the shadows to the side of the clearing, is the creature. It's over seven feet tall, its limbs unnaturally long, ending in those bloody claws. Its naked body is bone-thin, every rib visible, stretched taut over its frame. Its head is the worst part, a grinning skull with black pits where the eyes should be. Instinct takes over. I raise my rifle, squeezing off a shot. The creature jerks, a snarl echoing across the clearing. The bullet hit, but it seems to have barely phased the thing. Ron. I yell at Erica and Ben. They don't need telling twice. We race towards the ranger station, the creature loping after us, gaining ground with horrifying speed. I fire again, more out of desperation than hope and see it stumble but not fall. It seems enraged now, its screeches echoing through the forest and curdling my blood. The ranger station door bursts open. I shove Erica and Ben inside and slam it shut, fumbling with the deadbolts. Outside, the creature slams into the door, the wood groaning under the impact. I can hear its claws scrabbling against the thick oak. It won't hold long. We barricade the windows as best we can. I grab the station's radio voice shaking as I call for backup, trying to explain what's attacking us. Static crackles in response, then a disbelieving voice crackles through, Ranger Caleb? Is this a joke? No time to argue. My voice rises in a desperate plea, just get anyone out here, fast. In the room's dim light, Erica huddles in a corner, sobbing. Ben stands at a window, machete gripped tightly in white-knuckled hands. He looks determined, but fear flickers in his eyes. We're sitting ducks in here. Our only chance is if help arrives before that thing breaks through. The creature screeches in frustration. The door shudders as it throws its weight against it again. A sickening crack splits the wood. Caleb, it's not real, Erica shrieks. You made this up, it's some sick backwoods test, right? Shut up, Erica. Ben snaps, but I know doubt creeps into his own voice. This is madness. It defies everything we know about the natural world. Another crash. The door buckles inward the splintering wood tearing loose from the hinges. Then, a flicker of hope. Headlights break through the trees, two ranger vehicles screeching to a halt in front of the station. My colleagues, Thompson, Ramirez, and Miller, pile out, armed and confused. Caleb, 
What the hell is? Thompson starts, then sees the mangled door and the creature snarling in the opening. The world tilts into slow motion. The creature charges. Unnatural speed propels it forward, and it crashes through the ruined door like it's paper. Miller fires first, the shotgun blast tearing through the air, then the others open up. The creature staggers under the onslaught of bullets. Chunks of its flesh are blasted away, but it keeps coming, a relentless tide of bone and fury. Miller goes down, the creature's claws raking across his face, screaming. Thompson charges forward, trying to shield his wounded comrade. The creature seizes Thompson, its skeletal fingers wrapping around his body with impossible strength. Bones snap. Ramirez yells and empties her pistol into the struggling mass, to no avail. I rush forward, rifle gripped tight as I empty the last of my ammo into the creature. It shrieks, a sound that pierces my soul, and finally slumps to the floor. Even in death, the skull-like face seems to grin at me, mocking. Silence falls, broken only by Miller's anguished cries and Erica's choked sobs. I drop my rifle, numb. Thompson and Miller are both dead, brave men butchered by, by what? A nightmare given flesh? Backup finally arrives, more rangers, paramedics, a whole bewildered entourage. The aftermath plays out in a blur. Medical teams swarm the injured, stony-faced investigators take our broken statements, and the creature's corpse is hauled away, tagged and bagged like grotesque evidence. Erica and Ben are whisked away, likely into some kind of protective custody. My story, The Tale of a Monster in the Woods, is dismissed as trauma-induced delusion. The incident gets buried under mountains of official paperwork, another tragic accident in the unforgiving wilderness. I'm put on indefinite leave. The nightmares never truly fade, nor does the certainty that more of those things lurk in the shadows, unseen and waiting. I buy a shotgun, then another, and another. I hole up in my remote cabin, waiting for the next time the skull thing comes calling. Some nights, I swear I see those empty eye sockets staring in through my windows. I jump at every rustle of leaves, every snap of a twig. I'm never going back to Yellowstone, never going to set foot in another wild patch of woods as long as I live. Whatever I faced that day left a part of me shattered a part of me that will always know, monsters are real, and they're hungry. My name is Jonah, and this happened to me in August of 2016. I live in a small, self-built cabin on the outskirts of Glacier National Park in Montana. Peaceful is how I describe it, the scent of pine, the sound of the river nearby and the endless expanse of mountains and forests. Just me, doing my part as a park ranger to maintain this slice of wild paradise. This particular morning, I head out early on my usual patrol route. It's a clear, crisp day, and the trail winds its way through the dense forest. I'm checking for signs of illegal camping, keeping an eye out for wildfire risks, standard stuff. But as the morning stretches on, a sense of unease starts creeping in. I keep seeing movement out of the corner of my eye, just flashes. Probably dear, I tell myself, trying to rationalize the feeling that I'm being watched. The silence is the biggest thing. No animal calls. Not even the wind rustling leaves. Around midday, I reach a high ridge for a break. It usually offers a stunning view of the valley below. Today, something's off. 
I hear a rustling sound below me and snap my head up. At first, I think it's a bear cub. It's smallish, black, hunched over a pile of something on the forest floor. Then it stands, and that's when I see it clearly. It looks like a person, but the proportions are all wrong. The limbs are too long, and its skin clings to its bones like shrink wrap, giving it a gaunt, skeletal appearance. The head juts forward at an unnatural angle, and when it turns towards me, I see a face that will haunt my nightmares for the rest of my days. It's a skull, mostly, but with patches of leathery skin clinging to it. The eyes are milky white, clouded and unseeing, but it still feels like it's staring straight through me. Its mouth hangs open in a silent scream, revealing rows of needle-sharp teeth. My stomach lurches, and I know, instinctively, that this thing is not a bear. It's evil made flesh. It shuffles closer, a hideous parody of human movement, and I react. I grab my service rifle and chamber around. Stay back. I yell. My voice cracks with terror, but it doesn't react. It just keeps coming, a relentless predator with a single purpose. Panic propels me into action. I raise the rifle and fire a warning shot into the dirt near its feet. The sound thunders through the valley shattering the silence. The creature freezes for just a second, its skull-like face turning towards the source of the noise. And then it snarls, a guttural, rasping sound that cuts through me like a rusty knife. It lunges. Blindly, I fire again and again. The bullets tear into the creature, but it seems to barely slow it down. A ragged hole appears in its shoulder, spraying black ichor, but it just screeches louder, its skeletal face contorting in rage. I'm stumbling backwards, scrambling to reload. The creature closes in, its long fingers tipped with claws reaching for me. My boot catches a root, and I fall hard, the rifle flying from my grasp. I scramble to my feet, but it's too late. The creature is on me. A clawed hand clamps down on my shoulder, the nails piercing through my jacket. Pain explodes, white hot and blinding. I scream and lash out, throwing a desperate punch that connects with its jaw. The creature hisses in pain, reeling back. I scramble for the rifle. Distance is my only hope now. I lunge for the weapon, and my fingers grasp the cold metal. The creature snarls and lunges again, reaching for me. My hand closes around the trigger. I squeeze, and the rifle roars. The bullet hits the creature square in the chest. The impact knocks it backwards, and I fire again and again, pumping round after round into the monstrous form. The woods echo with gunshots and piercing shrieks, a symphony of violence echoing against the uncaring mountains. Finally, it falls. The creature thrashes on the forest floor, its movements slowing. The milky eyes roll back, and then it goes still. The silence that descends is deafening. I stand there, heart pounding, chest heaving. My shoulder throbs, and my vision blurs. Am I injured? In shock? It all feels so unreal. Slowly, I approach the creature. It smells like sulfur and rotting meat, a stench that makes me want to vomit. Even in death, it looks impossibly wrong, like a twisted mockery of everything natural questions flood my mind. What the hell was that? How could it exist? Where did it come from? And, my God, are there more? I can't stay here. 
Gathering my rifle, I stumble back down the trail, the image of that dead, skeletal face seared into my brain. At the ranger station, I break radio silence, my voice shaking as I report what happened. An emergency response team with a biologist is scrambled. I watch from a distance as they cautiously approach the corpse. What they find, whatever it is, is classified. Nobody believes my story, of course. My official report ends up buried in red tape, dismissed as the ramblings of a man who cracked under the pressures of the wilderness. I'm forced to resign, labeled as unstable. I find myself adrift, forever branded as the crazy ranger who saw a monster. I spend my days haunted by the milky eyes of that creature, and my nights screaming myself awake. I haven't been back to Glacier National Park since that day. Sometimes, I wonder if I hallucinated the whole thing, if my mind simply snapped under the weight of isolation. But deep down, I know what I saw. And I know it's out there, lurking in the shadows, waiting for its next victim. I try to get back to a semblance of normal life. Cities make me anxious now, the crush of humanity too much after the crushing solitude of the forest. I end up in a rundown farmhouse on the outskirts of a small town in Idaho. Therapy helps a little, a kind, patient therapist named Dr. Weiss slowly coaxes my story out of me. I get a prescription for sleeping pills but the nightmares still come, filled with scratching claws and those empty eyes. I start drinking more than I should to numb the fear. It's not a healthy way to live, but it helps me forget, at least for a while. I get the occasional letter from park rangers I used to work with. There are whispers about animal attacks in the area around Glacier, brutal and unsettling. Officially it's bears or mountain lions gone rogue, but I know in my gut the attacks are connected to what I saw. The guilt eats away at me. Could I have stopped it, somehow? Then, one day, a thick envelope arrives in my mailbox. Inside, photos are printed on cheap paper, the aftermath of one of those so-called animal attacks. But that's not an animal kill. The body on the ground is mangled, ripped apart. And next to it, scrawled in shaky, uneven letters, is a single word, remember. I throw up in the dusty yard, my mind reeling. They know I saw the creature. It knows. And this, this is a warning. Or maybe a promise. The paranoia ratchets up. I install security lights, a dozen locks on my doors and windows. I sleep with a hunting knife under my pillow, but it's a flimsy comfort. I know the creature could get in if it wants to. And now it knows where I am. The drinking gets worse. I start talking to myself, muttering about the creature to the empty house. Neighbors give me wide berth the crazy drunk whispering about monsters. I don't blame them, I barely recognize myself anymore. Dr. Weiss becomes more concerned with each visit. She talks about psychiatric care, facilities where I can get help. I tell her she's the crazy one, that if I go to one of those places, they'll never let me out. She shakes her head sadly then leaves another prescription on the kitchen table. Then one morning, as I'm fumbling for the bottle of whiskey before my hands even stop shaking, I see it. On my porch, a crude drawing is scratched into the dusty wood, a skull, with those empty eye sockets staring at the front door. I lose it. I scream and throw the whiskey bottle at the window, watching the glass shatter. I'm sobbing now, a broken mess of a man. 
Dr. Weiss is right. It's time to get help. But not the kind she's talking about. I buy a high-powered rifle, a scope, an arsenal of ammunition. Enough to start a small war. If that creature wants me, it can have me, but I'll go down fighting. I pack my beat-up truck with supplies and leave a note for Dr. Weiss, telling her I'm sorry and I should have listened. She'll probably find it after the police do. I'm driving north again, back towards Glacier. There's a reckoning coming, a final confrontation. Maybe I was chosen to witness this horror, and maybe it's my burden to end it. As the mountains loom closer, fear mixes with an odd sort of resolve. The creature may be stronger, it may be faster, but it doesn't have what I have now, the cold, desperate edge of a man with nothing left to lose. Somewhere in the shadowed forests, the creature waits. And I'm coming for it. After all, it still remembers me, and the hunt is far from over. The tragic aftermath hasn't been written yet, but it will be soon, in blood. My name is Grady and this happened to me in August of 2016. I live off the grid in a little cabin outside of Eureka, Montana, right up against the Canadian border. Used to work construction until a bad fall messed up my back. Found solace in a quiet life. Figure if nature wants to kill me, it'll at least be on its own terms. I'm out on a supply run in town, stocking up on staples at the general store, when old man Barkley grabs my arm. His eyes are wide, his voice barely above a whisper. Heard some yelling down by the creek last night, he says. Sounded bad. He goes on to describe what sounds like a vicious animal fight mixed with a human hollering. Barkley has a reputation for tall tales, but something in his demeanor tells me this ain't one of them. Back at the cabin, Unnie's gnaws at me. Not a bear, that ain't what Barkley described. And poachers wouldn't risk making so much damn noise. Curiosity, mixed with a sense of duty, goads me into action. I grab my old man's Winchester and head for the creek that cuts through my land. The closer I get, the heavier the air feels. There's a coppery tang hanging thick, the unmistakable scent of fresh blood. I move slower now, my finger resting lightly on the rifle's trigger. I round a bend and freeze. There's a clearing, and carnage. What's left of a body lies twisted in the dirt, surrounded by a mess of shredded clothes and crimson stains. Not a pretty sight, looks like whatever did this tore the person apart. Scavengers haven't gotten to it yet, so it's fresh. My stomach lurches. Could this have happened last night? While I was stocking up on canned beans? Then I see the tracks massive, misshapen footprints sunk deep into the mud, some clawed, others, almost human. A cold realization washes over me. Ain't no animal I know making those. Barkley's tale suddenly seems a whole lot more believable. My hunter instincts kick back in. I follow the tracks. They lead deeper into the woods, away from the creek. Whatever it is, it's big, and it's hurt, there are streaks of inky black blood mixed in with the red. I've made my decision. That poor soul by the creek deserved better than being left as wild animal fodder. And whatever did that to them, it needs to be put down. The sun starts its descent as I stalk my unseen quarry. The silence of the Montana forest broken only by my own footsteps and the pounding of my heart. The setting light casts long shadows that twist and dance, 
making every flicker of movement behind a tree seem monstrous. I find the creature crouched beside a half-eaten deer carcass. Even in the twilight, it cuts an imposing figure. Massive, towering over me with a skeletal frame draped in leathery gray skin. Its head snaps up, milky eyes locking onto me from a skull-like face. In the fading light, I can make out the gaping maw filled with rows of needle-like teeth. It lets out a low, guttural growl, like a predator warning off a competitor from its kill. I raise the Winchester, aiming for center mass. My hands are steady, fueled by a mixture of fear and a cold, hard fury. The first shot tears through the twilight, followed quickly by a second. The creature roars, not in pain, but in rage. It drops the carcass and charges, a blur of bone and teeth. I squeeze off another shot. It falters, but keeps coming. Damn things tougher than it looks. Blind panic threatens to take over, to turn me and run. But I dig in my heels. If I go down, it'll be fighting. I fire again just as the creature lunges. The bullet connects, and this time, a shriek rips through the air. Black blood sprays, and it staggers backward, clutching at its chest. It doesn't go down, but the fight seems to dim in those eerily intelligent eyes. Instead, it turns, and with a final hateful glare in my direction, crashes off into the encroaching darkness. The wounded creature disappears into the night, leaving me alone at dusk with the gnawing question of what the hell I just survived. After a minute of catching my breath, I shoulder the rifle and approach the creature's abandoned kill. It's a full-grown buck, ripped open with a brutal efficiency that has nothing to do with normal predation. I need proof of what I encountered, something to show I ain't gone crazy like everyone will think. My phone flashlight casts a weak beam, and I find what I'm looking for, a tuft of coarse, ragged fur snagged on a broken branch. It's definitely not from any critter around here. I pocket my grim trophy, my mind racing. Where did this thing come from? And why now? Back at the cabin, paranoia keeps me awake. I stoke the fire, barricading the door like I'm expecting a siege. Sleep doesn't come until long after the first light of dawn breaks through the trees. When I finally wake, the world looks a whole lot less friendly. For the next few days, I don't leave my property. I patrol the perimeter, finding more of those monstrous tracks always leading away. Seems I succeeded in driving it off, for now. But a sense of dread settles heavy on my shoulders. This ain't over. Then, word filters through from town, two hikers missing in the woods north of me, near the border. The way the ranger describes the scene at their abandoned camp, it sends shivers down my spine. I know those were the creatures doing. It's getting bolder, less afraid. There's no more ignoring it. I load up my battered old truck and head to town. Barkley is holding court on the general store porch, surrounded by a mix of worried and skeptical locals. I flash him the tuft of fur. His eyes widen, and a hush falls over the crowd. Tell him what you saw, I say grimly, then toss the evidence onto the weathered wood. I recount the whole bloody tale, leaving nothing out. The whispers start almost immediately, some calling me a liar, others glancing nervously towards the treeline. I ain't looking for believers, just for enough support to do what needs to be done. Surprisingly, it's the sheriff who steps forward. Old, grizzled, seen his share of hard things in these mountains. 
If half of this is true, he mutters, we got bigger problems than bears stealing trash cans. By nightfall, a grim posse assembles outside my cabin, the sheriff with a couple deputies, me, Barkley, and a handful of local hunters. It ain't much, but it's a start. We arm ourselves with rifles, knives, and a healthy dose of fear. The hunt stretches long and tense. We follow the creature's tracks deeper into the backcountry, the pristine beauty of the forest tainted by the unseen horror lurking within. One of the deputies, a young kid fresh out the academy, loses his nerve and heads back. Can't say I blame him. The rest of us press on, following a trail of blood and destruction. Half-eaten kills, unsettling howls echoing in the distance, it guides us relentlessly towards our goal. We close in, our footsteps hushed, adrenaline buzzing in my veins. Finally, at the edge of a deep ravine, we find it. Weak and wounded, the creature is backed against a sheer rock face, snarling its defiance. The sheriff raises his rifle, his face set in stone. He's a lawman, used to facing human threats, but this, this is something beyond his experience. I step forward. Let me, I say, my voice rough. This is my mess, my responsibility to end. The sheriff hesitates, then nods. I shoulder my father's Winchester, the feel of it familiar and comforting in my hands. The creature's empty eyes fix on me, a chilling intelligence glinting within. It knows this is the end. I try to think of the man torn apart by the creek, of the missing hikers. I harden my heart. This ain't a hunt anymore. It's an execution. I raise the rifle and take aim. The first shot rings out, shattering the silence. It hits home, but the creature does not fall. It snarls and stumbles, dragging itself along the rock wall. I fire again, and then again. At last, with a shuddering groan, it collapses to the ground, its milky eyes staring blankly at the sky. For a long moment, none of us speak. The aftermath is a blur. We report the incident, the words sticking in our throats like broken glass. More disappearances, more gruesome discoveries in the woods. The official story is animal attacks, rogue bears gone rabid. They tranquilize and relocate a few grizzlies for good measure, enough to calm the panicked folks. But those of us on that ravine, we know the truth. I try to go back to my solitary life, but it's different now. There's a darkness hanging over these woods that weren't there before. Patrols sweep the backcountry, flashlights cutting through the trees come nightfall. But I know like they know deep down, it's not enough. Whatever else is out there, the creature I killed wasn't the only one. The wild always had its teeth, now, they're just a little sharper. My name is Eli, and this happened to me in September of 1998. I've lived off the grid for over a decade, in a small, self-built log cabin nestled in the dense redwood forests of Northern California. I'm not a hermit, I love the peace and quiet, but I keep myself busy. I work as a wildlife conservationist, helping the Forest Service track animal populations and keep tabs on the ecosystem in this part of the world. The job suits me. I'm comfortable in my own skin a creature of routine, and I know these woods like the back of my hand. It's early fall morning when I set out on what should be a standard patrol checking trail cams, logging signs of elk and bear activity. It's mist season here. 
The fog rolls in, thick as cotton, turning the towering redwoods into ghostly shapes. Visibility is poor, and the damp chill clings to my bones even before the sun rises. An uneasy feeling starts tugging at me. The fog plays tricks on your eyes, but I swear I see movement in the trees ahead. I stop, squinting, listening hard. I hear nothing but the drip-drip of water from leaves. But, wait, there it is again, a sort of rustling sound. I radio my partner, Caleb, back at base camp. No answer. Probably just the reception acting up again out here. Time to get moving again. I press forward, pushing stubborn branches out of my way with a sigh. Then, I see it. A carcass a deer half-consumed, hanging from the lower branches of a redwood. It's hoisted high, out of reach of any normal predator. I inch closer. The carcass looks wrong. The gashes across its flanks aren't anything I recognize. They're too wide, with jagged, uneven edges. I've never seen a bear, mountain lion, or pack of coyotes do this kind of damage. Then, that rustling sound again, louder than before. I spin around, rifle raised, nothing. Whatever made the sound is big enough to move silently, despite its size. That's unsettling. I get the feeling that I'm not alone out here. I push down the rising panic, trying to reason it out. It's got to be a bear with an odd kill, right? Just a bear that got spooked and is probably watching me right now. I check the safety on my rifle and yell out into the fog, Hey, bear. Clear out. Silence. The heavy mist closes in around me. I need to leave. I turn to go, and that's when I see it. There, at the edge of the fog, is a massive silhouette. It looks like a person, only much taller, emaciated, with limbs that seem too long for its body. The head is slightly tilted, like it's curious, considering me. Its skin is taut over the bones, a sickly pale color that blends in with the fog. My heart starts hammering in my chest. This ain't no bear. The creature takes a silent step forward, revealing more of its form. Its fingers are like gnarled branches, tipped with long, yellowed claws. My mind races, trying to categorize this thing. Whatever it is, it's not natural. It should not exist. It takes another step and now I see its face. The mouth stretches in a grotesque parody of a smile, rows of needle-like teeth gleaming in the gloom. There are no eyes, just two dark sockets in the skull. My body reacts without thought. I raise the rifle and fire. The creature jerks back, and a deafening screech pierces the silence. The sound is an animal-like, more like metal scraping against metal. I smell something acrid in the air and, is that smoke? The creature turns and vanishes back into the fog with impossible speed. I stand there, frozen, not sure if what I saw was even real. My hand trembles, and I realize I've been holding my breath. Back at camp, Caleb stares at me like I've lost my mind when I tell him what I saw. The Forest Service has no records of any creature matching my description. Locals whisper of old tales, boogeymen meant to scare kids, nothing more. There's no official report filed, no warning issued. And that night, after barricading the cabin door and checking the windows three times, I lie sleepless as I hear something like claws scratching against the roof. Days roll into weeks. 
I find myself jumping at every unfamiliar sound. I keep seeing the creature's empty eye sockets in my dreams, hearing its screech in the wind whistling through the redwoods. I'm a shell of my former self, the rational outdoorsman replaced by a twitchy mess. Caleb worries, but I can't tell him the full truth, he'd think I was crazy. Finally, I break. I pack up what few belongings I need, abandoning the cabin I'd built with my own hands. I have to get away from this place, these woods. Driving down the coastal highway, the sense of dread slowly begins to lift. The redwood forests fade in the rearview mirror and the vast blue expanse of the Pacific stretches out to the horizon for the first time in weeks. I feel a sliver of hope, a fool's hope, maybe, but hope nonetheless. I pull into a small coastal town further down the highway. It's the kind of place where everybody knows each other, where the pace of life is determined by the tides. I find a rundown motel, the kind that doesn't ask too many questions. I pay for a week in advance intending to lie low and figure out my next move. That night, I lie awake in the musty room, the sound of the ocean a steady roar in the distance. Just as I begin to drift off, I hear it, a scraping sound by the window, like claws on the weathered wooden sill. I spring out of bed, heart pounding. I reach for the old hunting knife under the pillow, my hands clammy. At the window, there's nothing but the wind whipping the tattered blinds. I tell myself I'm imagining things, but the sense of unease sticks with me. In the morning, I decide to walk along the beach to clear my head. The ocean air is crisp, carrying the taste of salt, and the roar of the waves is almost enough to chase away the lingering fear. Almost. My eyes skin the stretch of empty beach when I spot something odd in the distance, a shadowy figure standing at the edge of the water. It's hard to see clearly against the glare of the morning sun. Uneasiness pricks at the back of my neck. Squinting, I realize it looks familiar. It's the creature. It stands perfectly still, its pale skin stark against the dark sand. It's watching me. Panic erupts again, a blinding wave of fear. I turn and run, blindly, back towards the town. I don't dare look back, just keep running until I'm gasping for breath, stumbling over uneven cobblestone streets. I burst through the doors of the local diner, a place filled with the comforting smell of coffee and bacon. People turn to look as I collapse into a booth. I mutter something about needing a drink, a lie even the waitress can see through. She pours me a coffee wordlessly, a flicker of pity in her eyes. I sit there, hands shaking, unable to focus. Out of the corner of my eye, I see a movement on the other side of the street. It's the creature, its gaunt figure unmistakable against the white clabbered houses. It stands unmoving, head tilted slightly, like it's found its prey. The diner door swings open, and a young family enters, laughing. The youngest, a boy of about six with bright red hair, darts over to the window and waves at me. And then he freezes, mouth open and a silent scream. His gaze is fixed on something over my shoulder. I don't need to turn around to know what he sees. The creature is pressed against the glass, its skeletal hand inches from the boy's face. Its empty eye sockets bore into mine, and that hideous smile stretches wider. I leap over the table, sending plates and cutlery flying as I shove the family to the floor. The creature crashes through the window, showering us in glass, its ear-splitting screech echoing through the diner. People scream, chairs overturn, and I grab the boy,
pushing the family through the back exit. We run blindly. I keep expecting to feel claws sink into my back, but I only hear the creature's enraged screeching fade into the distance. Finally, I collapse on the sidewalk, the boy's parents frantically calling for help. Sirens wail in the distance, but they're too late. The police question me for hours. I tell them the truth, even as they stare at me with thinly veiled disbelief. The townsfolk call me insane, a danger to the community. I'm forced to leave, branded a lunatic. And the creature? It's always there, lurking unseen, waiting. I see glimpses of it sometimes a pale hand darting behind a tree, a shadow flitting across a moonlit road. Its screech haunts my nightmares, ensuring I never truly sleep. My life is in ruins, my reputation shattered, all thanks to that thing. There's no going back to who I was. And the worst part? Nobody believes me. My name is Harlan, and this happened to me in September of 2019. Lived off-grid in the shadow of Mount Rainier for over a decade, solitude's a fine thing if you've had a belly full of the world. Worked as a ranger for a long stretch before that, so I've seen my share of nature's fury, but nothing prepared me for this. It starts as a call on the short wave. A frantic voice, one of those greenhorn hikers who thinks the backcountry is just a bigger park. Boy describes what sounds like a vicious animal attack, babbles something about his buddy being dragged off. Locations familiar, a remote trail I know well. Something about the situation sets off my old ranger instincts. Most attacks are bears spooked, maybe a cougar with a territorial streak. But there's a wrongness to the kid's voice, a terror that echoes down the crackling radio waves. I grab my rifle and head out. The hike up's a long burner. With each step, the gnawing unease in my gut grows heavier. There are none of the usual signs, no tracks or scat that don't belong. When I reach the site the kid described, my worst fears are confirmed. It's a bloodbath. Splashes of crimson stain the ferns, the ground churned up. There's a shredded backpack and, and what's left of the poor kid's buddy. What's done this, it ain't natural. No predator I know leaves behind a scene like this, a mix of brute force and savage precision. Then I see it, crouched over the remains. A skeletal monstrosity hunched like a starved dog, its skin stretched drum tight over protruding bones. It's gnawing on something, and as it turns, the sight burns into my brain. A horrifying skull-like face, the jaw dripping blood, and eyes that glow with a bone-chilling, malevolent light. It lets out a low growl that sets my teeth on edge before scrambling into the trees with unnatural agility. Stunned, I don't even react. It melts away like a shadow leaving me with the carnage and a sense of deep, primal dread. I call it in, every detail seared into my memory. The state police send out a chopper, thinking I'm either crazy or stumbled upon an escaped lunatic. They find no trace of the kid, nor of the creature. I start to doubt myself, to wonder if it's all some stress-induced hallucination. But then... The disappearances pile up. Seasoned hikers, a lone hunter, vanished around the same area. Officials write it off as mishaps, tragic but normal for such unforgiving wilderness. I know they're wrong. Those deaths, it's connected. Word reaches the outside, the kind of local legends that morph and twist with each telling. 
they call it the Rainier Ripper, the Mountain Devil, all those sensationalized names that miss the heart of the horror. I stay silent, stockpiling supplies and fortifying my remote cabin. Whatever this thing is, it's getting bolder. Months pass in tense limbo. Patrols sweep the area, but they're looking for a man, not a monster. I become my own one-man army, watching the tree line, setting traps, sleeping with a shotgun against the wall. The isolation that was once so peaceful is now a suffocating cage. One morning, I walk outside to find a fresh deer carcass dumped on my porch, an obscene offering. The creature is taunting me. It knows I know that I'm the only one in this godforsaken place that believes. My hands shake as I reload the rifle. The hunt isn't just a duty anymore. It's personal. Days bleed into a blur of patrols and sleepless nights. Then, one evening as the sun dips below the peaks, I hear it. A chilling screech echoing through the trees. Something's close. Adrenaline surges through my veins, a mix of terror and grim determination. This bastard took too much from this place from the serenity of these woods. It's time to make it pay. I stalk through the gathering twilight, rifle at the ready. The forest is eerily quiet, the air thick with anticipation. My heart thuds a frantic rhythm in my ears. Each rustle of leaves, each snap of a twig sends shivers down my spine. The sense that I'm being watched, hunted, is almost overpowering. And then, I see them. Flickers of movement in the encroaching darkness, glowing eyes reflecting the dying light. Not one, but several. A chill crawls down my spine. I underestimated their numbers. Maybe they've always been watching, lurking in the unexplored parts of the mountain, growing hungrier, boulder. One thing's for damn sure, this ain't a fight I can win alone. I start backing away, moving slow, trying not to make a sound. One of the creatures growls, low and menacing, and they start to close in, slinking through the undergrowth with that unnatural agility. Back at the cabin, I have a chance. The windows are barred, the door a damn fortress now. But reaching it means running, exposing myself in the fading light. Do I gamble, try to outrun them? Or hunker down here, hoping they don't smell my fear? Before I can decide, a guttural screech tears through the night, and a monstrous shape bursts from the trees, teeth bared. The creature hurtles at me, and instinct takes over. I raise the rifle and fire, again and again. The first shots seem to slow it, make it stagger, but the damn thing keeps coming. It crashes into me, knocking the rifle from my hands. The force of the impact sends us both tumbling to the forest floor. I scramble to regain my footing, the world spinning. The creature is on me claws like knives raking at my chest. I let out a yell, more of rage than of pain. The strength of desperation surges through me. I grab a fallen branch, jagged and heavy, and swing it like a club. It connects with the creature's skull with a sickening crunch. One of its glowing eyes goes dark as it shrieks, stumbling back. Seizing the moment, I lunge for the discarded rifle. I roll, leveling it just as another of the creatures launches itself from the shadows. My finger tightens on the trigger, and the gunshot cracks through the twilight stillness. The creature jerks midair, black blood erupting from its chest. It collapses in a heap. But they keep coming. 
I spin, firing into the encroaching darkness. My shots find their mark, halting their advance, but there are simply too many. A sense of despair starts to creep in. These things are relentless. With trembling hands, I reload. The gun clicks empty. I'm out of ammo. The remaining creatures advance, a circle of death closing around me. I raise the rifle like a makeshift weapon, a roar of defiance catching in my throat. If I'm going down, I'm going down swinging. Suddenly, a blinding light cuts through the gloom. Headlights. Two sets of them tear through the trees, tires churning up the dirt road. The creatures freeze, their eyes gleaming in the sudden brightness. Voices shout, a jumble of surprise and alarm. Ranger vehicles. Looks like they finally decided to investigate more than just the damn rumors. The creatures hesitate, then turn and flee with shocking speed vanishing into the undergrowth. I collapse to my knees, ragged breaths tearing from my lungs. I'm alive. Barely. The rangers rush over, flashlights illuminating my blood-splattered form. There's confusion, skepticism, until they see the ravaged earth around me, the monstrous footprints leading into the wilderness. Then, their gazes shift, and there's a flicker of horrified understanding. The aftermath is a blur. Choppers circle again, this time searching for me. Medical aid. Endless questions as I recount the months of terror, the sightings, the carnage. The story strains credulity, but evidence is impossible to deny. There's a somber sore of vindication, but it's overshadowed by a chilling certainty, this ain't over. The news spreads like wildfire, monsters in the Rainier wilderness, a predator defying all explanation. They evacuate the trails, put up warning signs no hiker pays heed to. I become a local legend, old man Harlan who fought the devil, a campfire tale spun to both thrill and terrify. I remain, a solitary guardian at the edge of the woods. My cabin is part bunker now, supplies stockpiled. The rifle is always loaded, always within reach. Folks say I lost my mind, that grief and the wild drove me round the bend. Maybe they're right. But I won't stop watching. Out there, in the ancient heart of the mountain, they lurk. I may have scared them off for the moment, wounded the pack. But wounds heal, hunger returns, and the mountains hold secrets older than mankind. One day, they'll be back. And when they do, I'll be waiting. My name is Ellis, and this happened to me in August of 2009. For over a decade, I've lived off the grid in the shadow of Mount Rainier, Washington. My cabin small, tucked away in a dense patch of old-growth forest, the kind of place most folks would never find even if they tried. I like it that way. I like the quiet and solitude. I'm an avid hunter and outdoorsman. I track deer and elk for weeks sometimes just me in the wilderness. These woods are my backyard, and I know them as well as any creature that calls this place home. Or, at least, I thought I did. Everything changes the day I spot the tracks. They're not natural. No animal native to these mountains makes a print like that, massive, with elongated toes ending in razor-sharp points. I dismiss it as a bear with a deformity, except I know better. There's a calculated feel to the tracks, like whatever made them was moving with a purpose. Over the next few days, an uneasy feeling creeps in. 
the animal calls disappear. Even the squirrels seem to have vanished. I find myself glancing over my shoulder constantly, imagining I hear footsteps just out of sight. I know I'm being watched. One evening, returning from setting traps, I find my campsite ravaged. My tent is ripped to shreds, my supplies scattered. And there, in the muddy earth, is another one of those unnatural footprints, right next to where my sleeping bag would have been. Fear clenches like a fist around my guts. Whatever made that track wants me to know it was there. Now, I'm the one being hunted. I retreat to my cabin, reinforcing the doors and windows. Nights become a torment. Every creaking floorboard sounds like claws scratching at the walls. I take turns peering out of the tiny windows, old shotgun trembling in my hands. It's only a matter of time before whatever's out there makes its move. Days stretch into tense, sleepless nights. One morning, I find a horrifying sight near the treeline, the mutilated corpse of a coyote. The bones are picked clean, and it's been torn apart with shocking strength. The message is chillingly clear, I'm next on the menu. That night, as darkness descends, I see it for the first time. Hulking in the shadows, watching my cabin as it moves with an unnatural, loping gait. I raise the shotgun, aiming for its hulking form, but the creature is too far for a reliable shot. Instead, I fire into the air, the blast echoing through the trees. It jerks back, startled, and for a heart-stopping moment, two glowing yellow eyes fixate on my window. Then, it retreats back into the darkness with shocking speed. I get only the barest glimpse, a skeletal figure, impossibly tall and lean, with skin stretched so tight over its bones that it appears translucent. Its skull-like head swivels back to stare at me before it vanishes completely. My mind scrambles for explanations, rejecting each one as too insane to be true. This thing can't exist, yet there it was, undeniable and real. The following morning, I make a decision. I'm not going to be trapped like an animal. I stash what few precious possessions I have in an old rucksack and shoulder my shotgun. It's time to confront this creature head on. I spend hours following its tracks. They lead me deeper into the woods than I've ever gone, winding through thickets and underbrush. It's getting harder to make out the trail now and the feeling I'm being watched grows even stronger. Then, up ahead, I see a cave mouth. The tracks disappear into the darkness of its depths. A flicker of doubt crawls through my mind, am I walking straight into a trap? But the thought of that thing prowling the woods near my cabin, stalking me endlessly, that gives me the grim resolve I need. I chamber around in the shotgun and flick on my headlamp. Its weak beam cuts through the inky blackness. The cave smells of mold and damp earth, a prickling sensation washing over my skin. Slowly, I step into the darkness. The passage twists and turns. The ground beneath my boots slopes deeper into the earth. And then, up ahead, I see a flicker of light. It's not natural light, but a sickly greenish glow pulsing steadily. Rounding a corner, I enter a cavern, and all the blood drains from my face. The cave is filled with things. Skeletal bodies hang suspended by sinewy cords from the ceiling, fleshy scraps still clinging to their bones. Pilfered clothing and gear lies in piles. I recognize a shredded backpack just like mine. Then I hear a shuffling sound, and the hair stands up on the back of my neck. Turning, 
I see a pair of glowing yellow eyes emerge from the darkness. The creature is even more horrific up close. Its elongated, clawed fingers twitch, and a low growl rumbles deep within its impossibly thin chest. I raise the shotgun. The shotgun roars, the blast echoing through the cave. The creature flinches back, a guttural screech ripping from its throat. But I miss, the shot hitting the rock wall behind it, sending chips of stone flying. It lunges at me with blinding speed, a whirlwind of claws and teeth. I stumble backwards, barely managing to raise the gun as a shield. The creature slams into me, sending us both crashing to the ground, its claws raking across my arm. Pain explodes, and the shotgun is knocked from my grasp. I kick desperately, trying to dislodge the creature. It smells like rot and sulfur, the stench burning my nostrils. With shocking strength, it clamps its skeletal fingers around my throat, squeezing with terrifying force. My vision starts to blur around the edges. In desperation, I grab its skull-like face, my fingers sinking into the empty sockets where its eyes should be. It screeches again and rears back giving me the slightest bit of breathing room. I scramble to my feet, searching for anything that can be used as a weapon. My fingers close around a loose rock on the cave floor, and with a final surge of adrenaline, I lash out. The rock connects squarely with the side of the creature's head. It howls, a sound that reverberates through the cave, stumbling sideways. I seize the opportunity, lunging forward and smashing the rock down again, this time directly into one of its glowing eyes. The eye socket shatters with a sickening crack, and the creature recoils, clutching at its injured face. Yellowish fluid dribbles down its skull, and its screeching becomes a continuous, ear-splitting wail. Stumbling and half-blind, it crashes into the cave wall and collapses in a twitching heap. Now's my chance. I snatch up the shotgun and bolt back down the passageway, not daring to look back. I burst out of the cave, gasping for air. The sunlight feels blinding after the oppressive darkness. I race down the mountainside, ignoring the searing pain in my arm, the burning in my lungs. I don't stop running until I reach my cabin, collapsing against the door. In the weeks that follow, I become a prisoner in my own home. I reinforce the cabin, stock up on supplies, and wait. But the creature doesn't return. The woods seem to hold their breath, a terrifying stillness descending over the area. Then, one day, a ranger knocks on my door. He's been making his rounds and noticed signs of forced entry at my campsite. I tell him everything, the tracks, the creature, the cave. He listens patiently, skepticism clear on his face. I don't blame him, I sound like a raving lunatic. The ranger offers to investigate the cave with backup. And, after a moment of hesitation, I agree. Maybe, just maybe, there's still a chance to end this nightmare once and for all. When we arrive, the cave is exactly as I left it. The skeletal remains hang in their grotesque tableau, the stench of death permeating the air. But there's no sign of the creature, not even bloodstains where it had been injured. It's as if it vanished into thin air. The official reports dismiss my story as a probable animal attack and stress-induced psychosis. The ranger who found me, the one who went into the cave with me, he keeps his doubts to himself, only offering a sympathetic nod in my direction. I never go back to my cabin on Mount Rainier. The forest, once my sanctuary, now feels like a cursed place, 
full of dark secrets best left undisturbed. The aftermath is a blur of sleepless nights and therapy sessions. I've become a hollow shell of my former self. The creature might be gone, but it still stalks my nightmares. I jump at every shadow, my hand always reaching for a shotgun that's never there. Some nights, I think I hear a scratching sound at my window, and that familiar, fetid odor seems to seep into the room. I'll spend the rest of my life looking over my shoulder, wondering if the next time I see those glowing yellow eyes, it will be the last. My name is Malachi, and this happened to me in October of 2012. Lived off-grid up in the Olympic Peninsula of Washington State for more years than I care to count. Ex-military, went into the woods to find some peace, and darn it, I nearly did, until, well, until this. I'm working late, splitting firewood for the upcoming winter. Figure one more load and I can call it a night. That's when the dogs start acting up. Got two huskies, good working dogs, not the type to bark at shadows. Now, their hackles raised, growling low, staring off into the trees. Chalk it up to a raccoon or something, until I catch a whiff of it. Rotting meat mixed with something, musky and rank. Doesn't match any animal around here. Before I can process it, a blood-curdling howl splits the air. It echoes through the forest, chilling me deeper than any winter's night. And it's close. I yell for the dogs, but they stay rooted to the spot, whining now. Whatever's out there has them spooked. My instincts scream at me, get inside, barricade the cabin. But pride's a stupid thing, even out in the boonies. Can't have something rattle me in my own backyard. I grab the shotgun leaning against the porch. The moon casts a pale glow across the clearing as I step into the night, straining my eyes towards the tree lean. The dogs whimper at my feet, and I gotta admit, I don't blame them. Then I see it. A massive, hulking figure hunched at the edge of the trees. It's tall, taller than any man, with skin stretched like old leather over protruding bones. Its eyes catch the moonlight, glowing an eerie yellow. But it's the skull-like head that sends a jolt of pure terror through me. This ain't no bear, no cougar gone rogue. This is something, unnatural. Without thinking, I raise the shotgun and fire. The blast splits the night, and the creature jerks back with an inhuman screech. It stumbles, clutching at its chest. I pump another shell, aiming again. It snarls and starts scrambling away on all fours, disappearing into the brush with unnatural speed. Shaking, I reload. The dogs are whining and circling me now, but I can't seem to move. Part of me wants to follow it, finish the damn thing off. The other part, the same part, urges me towards the safety of the cabin. Common sense wins, barely. I slam the door and barricade it with trembling hands. This ain't some stupid campfire story anymore. It's real, it's out there, and it's wounded. The rest of the night's a haze. I stoke the fire, pace, my heart a frantic drumbeat against my ribs. Every creak of the tree sends me lunging for the shotgun. First light feels like it'll never come. As the sun breaks over the trees, I cautiously venture out, dogs glued to my heels. It's the blood trail that finally breaks me. Thick, black, and acrid smelling, it leads into the woods, stark against the vibrant fall colors. This, this ain't natural. 
and whatever I shot, it bleeds. I call the county ranger. Tell him some half-baked story about an injured animal, needing help tracking it. The ranger, Ben, knows me, knows I ain't the type for tall tales. He arrives within the hour with a deputy named Riggs, young and cocky. We find where the creature had collapsed, judging from the amount of blood and the trampled undergrowth. The smell is even more intense here, a gut-churning stench that makes Riggs turn pale. Ben's eyes are narrowed, fixed on the trail. We follow it cautiously, rifles raised. The trees grow thicker, the forest primeval and quiet. Then, we come across a clearing scattered with animal remains, half-eaten and decomposing. Buzzards circle overhead, a grim beacon. In the center of it all, freshly killed, is what remains of a massive buck. Its rib cage is splayed open, organs torn out with terrifying savagery. The tracks surrounding the carcass are enormous, mangled prints far larger than any wolf or mountain lion. Ben looks at me, not a shred of doubt in his eyes. What did you see out here, Malachi? I hesitate, the ridiculousness of the truth hanging heavy. But these men, they deserve to know what they're facing. I describe the creature in the moonlight, its skeletal form, and those glowing eyes. Riggs scoffs, but Ben holds up a hand, silencing him. When I finish, he nods solemnly. Legends ain't always just stories, huh? Think it's still out here? The question hangs in the air, unanswered. We find no other sign of the creature, only a blood trail that stretches endlessly into the heart of the ancient woods, fading into the wilderness. We spend the rest of the day scouring the forest, finding nothing but an ever-dwindling blood trail and the pit of dread growing heavier in my gut. By dusk, with no fresh signs, even Ben has to admit it's a lost cause. Whatever I wounded, it's either dead or vanished deeper into the wilds. Riggs leaves with a dismissive snort, assuring us it's just some big, ugly critter, nothing more. Ben stays back, a troubled look in his eyes. Don't underestimate this thing, Malachi. You did good alerting us. Now, stay vigilant. We both know the words feel hollow. What can even a seasoned ranger do against the monstrous unknown? Word spreads through the backwoods faster than wildfire. Locals whisper about my encounter, theories ranging from escaped zoo animals to the plain old crazy hermit seeing things. I ignore the speculation. Out here, reputation is earned, not given, and they know I ain't one for lies. The aftermath hangs over me like the relentless Olympic fog. I patrol my property relentlessly, fortifying the cabin. My sleep is haunted by those glowing eyes. The dogs refuse to stray more than a few yards from the house, their senses sharp with unease. In the woods, the ancient heart of this wilderness suddenly feels hostile, filled with unseen eyes watching me. Then, a month later, it escalates. A group of college kids, the adventurous sort who ignore the warnings, vanish from their campsite. A search party finds their mangled tent and a scene out of a nightmare, blood, shredded remains, and those same monstrous tracks. Ben calls me in. He sits at his worn desk in the ranger station, looking ten years older than the last time I saw him. Malachi, he starts, his voice weary, we need your help. Those kids, it matches what you saw. A grim duty settles over me. I tell them everything, the creature, the kill site, the whole damn mess. Ben and a couple of the old-timers in the department exchange dark looks. 
They heard them, the whispered tales the tribes passed down. They just never believed, not until now. For the next few weeks, it becomes my war. I lead a team of rangers, experienced hunters, and the odd determined biologist into the backcountry, the place where maps fade and shadows grow long. We track the creature, lay traps, set up night vision cameras. We find more carnage, more evidence of its intelligence, its growing boldness. It's toying with us, staying one step ahead. The tension wears on us. One ranger disappears in the middle of the night, no trace, no scream. The biologist cracks, muttering about old gods and fleeing back to civilization. Ben's jaw clenches with grim determination, but I see a flicker of fear in his eyes that mirrors my own. One moonlit night, it happens. We're huddled near a makeshift camp when the forest goes deathly silent. Not even the crickets chirp. Then, a chilling screech pierces the air, echoing from somewhere chillingly close. We scramble for our rifles, Ben barking orders. Adrenaline drums a frantic rhythm in my veins as shapes flicker at the edge of the firelight. They descend upon us in a blur of claws and fangs. Not one creature, but several. I fire, hearing the echoing reports of the other's rifles. One of the creatures lunges at me, a skeletal flash in the darkness. I squeeze off a shot, and it recoils with a shriek. Black blood splatters my clothes. The fire sputters as the creatures close in. Ben yells, there's another inhuman screech, and then a terrible silence. A guttural growl sends shivers down my spine. I spin around, rifle trembling in my hands. There it is, bathed in the dying firelight. It's bigger than I remember, leaking black ichor from fresh wounds. Those empty, glowing eyes bore into mine, and I swear there's a terrible calculation in them. This is it, my brain screams my last stand. I raised the shotgun one last time. My name's Harlan, and this happened to me in October of 2016. Living off-grid, tucked away in Wyoming's Wind River Reservation, figured if I'd survived Fallujah, I could handle some wilderness solitude. Turns out, there's worse things lurking in the woods than insurgents. Autumn up here paints the mountains in fire, the last burst of life before the unforgiving winter. Spend my days hunting, stocking the larder for the lean months. Checking trail cams is part of the routine, keeps track of the wildlife, alerts me to potential poachers. One crisp morning, as the dawn casts long shadows, I upload the images from a remote camera. Expecting another gallery of elk and deer, what I see stops my blood cold. Blurred snapshots reveal a nightmare. Some thing hunched and skulking near a watering hole. Too tall for a bear, too thin for a moose. It moves on four legs, but then rears up onto two, the motion jerky and unnatural. Its skin looks stretched tight over bone, its head a bleached skull with horns jutting out, mismatched like a broken crown. And the eyes, they're empty pits in the skull, yet I swear they burn right into the camera, into me. Ice floods my veins. This ain't some freak of nature. I've faced my share of the world's evils, and this, this is something different, something darker. I call the tribal police. They've heard the old stories locals whisper, legends of a Wendigo, a ravenous spirit that haunts these mountains. They humor me, send old Jake about to settle my nerves. 
Jacob's weathered face splits into a wry grin when he sees the photos. Thought those tales were just for scaring greenhorns, he admits, a touch of unease beneath his humor. Gives me the rundown, Wendigo, corrupted by greed and hunger, forever hunting, never satisfied. And, worst of all, its bite can turn a man, twist him into another ravenous beast like itself. Jacob leaves me with a cryptic warning, that creature's old, cunning. Best option is to leave the area, let it starve out. But something about those burning eyes, the way it seemed to fixate on me across time and distance, it stirs a cold fury within me. I ain't the type to back down from a fight, never was. Even if the enemy ain't human. I spend the next few days preparing. Cabin becomes a fortress, windows barred, every gun cleaned and loaded. I tell myself it's caution, but deep down, a reckless voice whispers the truth, I'm laying bait. Nights stretch into an endless vigil, punctuated by the eerie howl of the wind. Every creaking floorboard sounds like claws scratching at the door. Then, under the cold light of a full moon, it comes. A silhouette steps out from the trees, skeletal form unmistakable against the snow-dusted ground. Its skull head tilts, as if sniffing the air. Those empty eye sockets seem to bore right into the cabin. Then, it lets out a chilling shriek that echoes through the valley. Come out, little hunter. A raspy voice drifts through the night, carrying on the wind. It sounds both ancient and savagely hungry. Your hunt ends tonight. I swallow a surge of fear, grip my rifle. Whatever this thing is, running ain't an option anymore. It knows I'm here, and somehow, it knows my name. The next few hours are a blur. The initial attack's brutal. The creature possesses shocking strength and speed for something so emaciated. It circles my cabin like a wolf, testing the defenses, each chilling shriek setting my nerves on edge. I manage to drive it off with gunfire, wounded even, judging by the trail of black blood leading back into the trees. But I know that's not the end. Far from it. The creature circles back, its guttural growls and shrieks a constant torment outside my door. It's toying with me, breaking me down. And then, the worst sound of all. Silence. The sudden stillness is more unsettling than the constant assault. Dread coils in my stomach. When it strikes again, it'll be cunning. And that's when I hear it, a soft scratching at the roof. Damn things found its way up top, a terrifying reminder of its unnatural agility. I hold my breath, listening to the scraping claws just above my head. The creature's up there, circling, looking for a way in, and the flimsy cabin roof ain't going to hold it back for long. I need a distraction. Something to draw it away from its relentless assault. And that's when it hits me. The old shed out back. It's stocked with fuel canisters, propane tanks, all the things smart folks know not to keep near the living quarters. Risky as hell, but right now, risky might be my only shot. I slip out the back door, using the noise of the wind to mask my movements. Sprinting for the shed, I feel exposed, waiting for those skeletal claws to tear down from the darkness above. I reach the shed, yank open the rickety door, the stench of gasoline hitting me like a wave. Frantically, I start setting my plan into motion. Grab two fuel cans, splash their contents across the shed's interior. The fumes sting my eyes make my head spin. I rig up a trail of gasoline leading back to the cabin, 
then toss a lit match into the shed. The explosion rocks the night. Flames lick at the wooden structure, illuminating the clearing like a gruesome beacon. I scramble back to the cabin, slam the door, just as the creature bursts from the burning wreckage, its skeletal frame outlined against the inferno. It lets out a screech of pure fury, and charges. This is it, the final stand. I level my rifle, firing shot after shot into the oncoming beast. It flinches with each hit, black blood spraying the snow. But those empty eyes blaze with an insatiable hunger, and it keeps coming. I'm almost out of ammo when another sound splits the night, the unmistakable wop-wop of chopper blades. Relief floods through me. Search and rescue must have picked up the fire, or maybe the gunfire. Either way, salvation swooping in from above. The chopper's spotlight pierces the darkness, pinning the creature in its unforgiving glare. For the first time, I see it clearly, the withered skin, the gaping moth filled with jagged teeth, the antlers splayed like a demonic crown. Then, the impossible happens. With a final roar of defiance, the creature leaps, an unnatural burst of speed launching it clear off the ground. It crashes into the side of the chopper, claws gouging metal. The aircraft shudders and spins, a blinding whirlwind of snow and chaos. I can hear the screams of the crew over the roar of failing rotors. The chopper slams into the ground, erupting in a fireball that dwarfs the burning shed. Stunned, I sink to my knees. They came to help, and my recklessness doomed them. Now there's nothing left to stop the monster. It emerges from the wreckage, singed but unbowed, its eyes fixed on me once more. A bone-deep exhaustion washes over me. No more bullets, no more tricks left. All that's left is a chipped hunting knife and the bitter certainty that this is where I die. Yet, amid the despair, a flicker of defiance remains. It's that same stubborn defiance Jacob saw in my eyes when he warned me about the Wendigo. The creature stalks towards me, slow and deliberate, savoring its victory. I rise to my feet, raise the knife in a futile gesture, and roar my last challenge into the night. The aftermath is found by the second rescue team, the one that comes after the first never returns. Charred remains of a cabin, a monstrous corpse the likes no biologist can explain, and my own half-eaten body, a bloody testament to a battle against the unimaginable. There's no official explanation. Whether malfunction, a freak backcountry accident. But Jacob finds me one last time before they cart the bodies away. He clasps a weathered hand on my shoulder, speaking low so the others won't hear. You fought well, Harlan. Sometimes. He glances at the creature's grotesque form a sadness in his ancient eyes, sometimes, darkness takes its share. But there's always those who stand against it, even in the face of the end. They don't put my story in any newspaper. The legend of the Wendigo, though, it grows in these mountains. Whispers carry my name alongside tales of the old heroes who faced the darkness long before me. And those whispers carry a warning too, monsters lurk in the wild places, always hungry, always waiting. And even if you don't believe, even if you tell yourself it's just old stories told to scare the tourists. Well, best keep a rifle loaded and an eye on the shadows. You never know what might be hunting you in the night. My name is Ezekiel, and this happened to me in September of 2010.
I spent eight years as a sniper in the Marines before trading the desert for the trees. Bought myself a little spread tucked deep in the hollers of Appalachia, figured it was as good a place as any to find some peace, or at least to stop looking over my shoulder. Hike up to the ridge most mornings as the sun breaks. Makes for fine deer scouting this time of year, and the view ain't bad either. This particular day, though, there's something wrong in the woods below. A silence that ain't natural, an emptiness where birdsong and the rustle of critters ought to be. The back of my neck prickles, old instincts kicking back in. I drop to a crouch behind some brush, rifle at the ready. Then, the smell hits me. Musky, rotten, like death left too long in the sun. Heard stories from the old timers in town, whispers of something monstrous lurking out in the wild places. Figured it was tall tales, bored men scaring greenhorns. But now, maybe those folks knew more than they let on. Through the scope, I see the reason for the eerie quiet. A doe lies sprawled in a clearing, its carcass half stripped to the bone. No kill I ever saw. Coyote, bobcat, they leave their mark in a certain way. This is surgical, precise. And then I see the tracks surrounding the remains. They're enormous, misshapen, and unlike anything in my wildlife guide. Something bigs out here, something dangerous. I radio the state wildlife guys, figure they'd want to investigate, make sure it ain't some escaped exotic pet turned feral. They tell me to keep out of it, that they're sending a team to assess. I ain't the type to sit on my hands though, never was. I spend the rest of the day studying those tracks something's wrong about them, but I can't put my finger on it, not yet. That night, sleeps a stranger. Next morning, I'm up at dawn, a hunter now instead of the hunted. Following those monstrous prints into the woods. They lead me deeper than I've ever gone, twisting through gnarled thickets and along forgotten creek beds. The deeper I push, the heavier the sense of unease pressing down on my shoulders. Finally, the tracks disappear into a yawning cave mouth half hidden by vines. Damn, this is reckless even for me. No backup, no real idea what the hell I'm walking into. But that carcass, those tracks, it's a compulsion now, something I gotta see through. I inch into the gloom, rifle raised, flashlight cutting a weak swath against the darkness. The cave's damp and close. Smells worse in here, like a slaughterhouse gone bad. After what feels like an eternity of twists and turns, the tunnel opens into a wide chamber. And that's when I see it. Crouched in the shadows, Feasting on something I pray is just an unlucky deer, is the creature. It's gaunt, with skin stretched tight over bone, looking hairless and wrong. But what burns into my mind is the head, skull-like, devoid of eyes, with a jaw full of needle-sharp teeth that gleam in the dim light. For a heart-stopping moment, it just gnaws at its meal, oblivious to me. I take in the details, the inhuman way it moves, the two long limbs that end in razor claws. Then, like it finally senses my presence, the creature's head snaps up. It doesn't have eyes. But it sees me. I freeze. Some primal survival instinct screams to run, but another voice, a cold and steady one, tells me running's a death sentence. This thing's fast, faster than anything I've ever seen. My only chance is to make this first shot count. I raise the rifle, center the scope on its chest. My finger tightens on the trigger. The creature lets out a piercing shriek, then lunges forward in a blur, 
disappearing from view just as I pull the trigger. The gunshot booms through the cave, echoing back a hundred times over. Stale dust chokes the air. My ears are ringing. I can't tell if it's the adrenaline or the concussion. For a terrifying moment, there's only silence. Did I miss? No time to think, I chamber another round, scanning the shadows with trembling hands. Then, from the far corner of the chamber, a guttural snarl cuts through the silence. I didn't kill it. I only wounded it. I hear it scrabble as it tries to regain purchase on the slick cave floor. The flashlight beam follows the sound, then catches a flash of yellow. Its eyes. I was wrong, it does have eyes, narrow slits burning like embers deep within its skull. They fixate on me with pure, malevolent hatred. The creature lunges again. This time I see the movement, track it like a seasoned predator. I fire again, and this time a chilling howl rips through the cavern. Black blood spatters the cave wall. But the damn thing's still coming, relentless, driven by pain and fury. I fire again and again. The acrid smell of gunpowder hangs heavy in the air. With each shot, it slows, its movements becoming ragged. Yet, impossibly, it keeps pushing forward. Its glowing eyes remain fixed on me, filled with an unnatural rage. This ain't no animal cornered. This is something, something else. My gun clicks on an empty chamber. I stumble backwards, panic threatening to consume me. All those years in the core, all that training, and it might not be enough. I fumble with shaking hands for another magazine, there has to be one, there always is. But my ammo pouch is empty. I drop the spares during the chase, focused on nothing but tracking the damn thing. The creature closes in, a skeletal wraith hungry for vengeance. I raise the rifle, ready to use it as a makeshift club. A futile last stand. A flicker of movement above makes me look up just in time to see a sliver of daylight. A narrow shaft carved by erosion, a way out, if I can reach it. The creature screeches, then lunges. I roll, the swipe of its claws barely missing my face. There's a tearing pain in my side, but I shove the thought away. Now. I scramble to my feet, lunging for the narrow opening. Rocks crumble under my boots as I pull myself upward through the tight gap. The last thing I see before the light engulfs me is the creature, reared up on its hind legs, its skeletal form a grotesque silhouette against the darkness of the cave a final blood-curdling screech echoing in my ears. I roll down a shallow embankment and don't stop running until I burst back into the familiar woods, gasping for air that doesn't taste of ancient decay. Back at my cabin, I clean and dress my wound, the torn flesh stinging. It's a lucky miss, could have been disemboweled if I hadn't reacted in time. I make a call that'll land me in a whole heap of trouble, lie through my teeth to the wildlife authorities about some rabid animal, downplay the injuries and the creature. Can't have them going back in there, can't risk anyone else seeing what I saw. The aftermath ain't pretty. Nightmares plague me, the glowing eyes of the beast seared into my memory. The folks around town see I'm shaken, start asking questions I ain't answering. Rumors swirl, and soon those old tales of monsters in the Appalachians find new life. Word reaches the wider world too, cryptozoologists, wannabe ghost hunters, all descending on these quiet hills like vultures. Locals start disappearing. 
livestock turns up ravaged in a way that don't fit any predator they know. I know the truth, even as the officials blame bears, bad men in the woods. I arm myself, fortify my cabin, wait for the inevitable. Sleep's a precious commodity now. I barricade the windows, check every shadow with a hunter's eye, always waiting for that terrible shriek to split the night. Sometimes, I swear I smell that rotting stench drifting on the breeze, that I glimpse a skeletal shape lurking at the edge of the tree line. The folks hereabouts, they look at me a little differently now. Zeke the recluse went from a curiosity to the crazy old vet with a wild story and a haunted look in his eye. And maybe they're right. Maybe I am going mad. But if I do finally snap, if I go out there with a torch and burn those woods to the ground in search of the creature that took my peace, well, maybe there's a little bit of madness lurking in these mountains anyway. A primal kind, old as the hills themselves, that only shows its face when something unnatural comes creeping out of the dark. My name is Rowan, and this happened to me in October of 2010. I spent most of my adult life off the grid, an old airstream tucked away in a remote corner of the vast Alaskan wilderness. I loved the isolation. The silence was a bomb for my soul, a stark contrast to the hustle and bustle of my younger days in the city. Solitude suited me just fine. That fall, a lucrative contract had me back in the bush, miles from civilization, surveying a potential new logging site for a corporation I'll leave unnamed. I'd done this type of work plenty of times before. It was always the same, long hikes through unforgiving terrain, collecting data, and the occasional grumpy run-in with a protective mother bear. But this time, there was something different about the woods. They felt empty in a way that wasn't natural. No birds, no scurrying squirrels, not even mosquitoes buzzing about. An oppressive silence settled over me like a suffocating blanket. Then, there were the carcasses. Usually, you'd find the odd animal remains, the natural cycle of life and death playing out. But this, this was on another scale. Elk, deer, even a couple of wolves, all half-devoured. And what was done to them, it was pure savagery. I'm used to harsh realities of the wild, but this was different. The kills were messy, ripped apart with a fury that didn't seem possible for any predator I'd ever encountered. It gave me a crawling unease I couldn't shake. I radioed my contact, a gruff old Alaskan named Wyatt who ran the nearest outpost. Told him about the strange silence in the woods and the animal remains. He scoffed over the radio, something about tenderfoot city folk getting spooked by shadows. You'll be fine, son. Just keep your head down, finish the survey, and get your money. Ain't no booby men out there. But now, as dusk begins to fall, and the trees start looking more like grasping claws, I'm not so sure about Wyatt's dismissive attitude. Something moves in the periphery of my vision. A flicker of unnatural paleness in the deepening darkness. My heart thuds painfully against my ribs as I whirl around, gripping the shotgun I've carried for years but never had to actually use. It's massive, at least seven feet tall even hunched over. Its skin is stretched tight over protruding bones, a sickly grayish white in the fading light. Its elongated fingers end in wicked, sickle-like claws, and its face, good lord, the face. It's more skull than face, with taut skin revealing the hollowed-out cheekbones and grinning jaw. Where its eyes should be are two inky black pits, 
boring into my soul. Then it smiles, a parody of the expression that reveals rows of needle-sharp teeth. There's no rational explanation for this creature. No bear, no wolverine, nothing out here fits this gruesome description. It takes a step toward me. I react, instinct overriding conscious thought. The shotgun roars, and the blast tears through the eerie silence. The creature stumbles back with a piercing shriek, a sound that raises the hair on my arms. Its shoulder is a bloody mess, but the damage seems minimal. It stares at me, an ugly intelligence flickering in those empty eye sockets. Time slows down. I know I should run, but my legs won't obey. Every fiber of my being screams at me to get the hell out of there, but I'm frozen. The creature recovers, and it lunges, impossibly fast for something of its size. The shotgun is knocked from my grasp, clattering against the rocky ground. I scramble back, reaching for the hunting knife sheathed at my hip. I'm too slow. A clawed hand seizes my arm with shocking strength, those filthy nails digging into my flesh through my thick jacket. I'm yanked effortlessly toward that terrible, grinning face. The smell of it, of rotten meat, decay, and something sulfurous, washes over me. Nausea churns in my stomach. The creature's other hand swipes out, the long claws a blur. Pain explodes across my face, searing through my left eye. I cry out, a guttural roar of pain and terror. The creature jerks back, and the burning hot pain is momentarily replaced by a numb blankness. My hand flies to my face, and comes away slick with blood. The creature hisses, and I can see blood clinging to its claws. I must have injured it maybe even blinded it on that side. A sliver of desperate hope sparks within me. I use the creature's momentary hesitation to kick out wildly, connecting with its wounded shoulder. It roars again, the sound echoing through the silent woods. I scramble backwards, ignoring the searing pain from my face and the growing fear that I'm half-blinded. The creature charges and I dodge, diving between thick tree trunks, weaving desperately through the shadows. It crashes after me, its movements clumsy but still dangerously fast. Branches whip at my skin and I can hear the ragged rasp of its breath close behind. Then, a flicker of light. I break through the tree line and see it, why it's outpost its weathered log cabin a beacon against the growing darkness. Why it must be inside, and why it has guns. I race towards the cabin, heart pounding like a trapped bird against my ribs. The creature is closing in. I bellow Wyatt's name, my voice ragged and desperate. The cabin door bursts open, and there's Wyatt, his old shotgun raised. In the split second before he sees the creature emerge from the trees behind me, I see the disbelief on his face. It's the last thing I clearly register. The creature crashes into Wyatt, a whirlwind of claws and teeth and rage. Wyatt lets out a startled yell as he's thrown to the ground. The shotgun clatters uselessly to the side. In the moonlight, I see a flash of silver, Wyatt's hunting knife. Then it's lost in a tangle of limbs and sickening sounds. Then I'm running again. Not back into the woods, I'm not that stupid, but towards the truck Wyatt had parked next to the cabin. I fumble desperately for the keys that jingle in. My pocket. The truck door wrenches open, and I scramble inside slamming it shut and locking it just as the creature reaches me. It pounds against the truck, its claws shrieking against the metal. Through tear-blurred vision, 
I search frantically for the ignition. The keys. My fumble frozen fingers finally find them and slip the key into place. The engine roars to life, a blessed sound in the deathly quiet. The creature rears up against the windshield, its skull-like face contorted, that terrible grin stretched impossibly wide. Its empty eye sockets seem to bore into mine, filled with a chilling promise of pursuit. I throw the truck into reverse, and stomp on the gas. Tires spin against the dirt as the truck hurls backwards, away from the cabin and back towards whatever road I'd taken to get here. Behind me, the cabin and the night erupt into chaos, punctuated by screams and the monstrous screeching of the creature. But I don't look back. I drive blindly through the night, guided only by the pale beams of my headlights cutting through the desolate Alaskan wilderness. Eventually, I find my way back to a main road, and then to a town. My face throbs, the bloody mess that was once my eyes sealed shut. I go to a hospital, mumbling a story about a bear attack. They clean me up, patch me together, and look at me with a mixture of pity and suspicion. Nobody believes my wild story about the creature in the woods. The official report cites a bear attack, maybe even a road with rabies, despite my insistence that it was something else, something far more terrifying. I leave the hospital and never go back to Alaska. I spend my savings on a rundown cabin in a remote corner of the Rockies, trying to bury the memories. But they always come back. Sometimes, in the dead quiet of the night, I swear I can hear the scratching of claws against my window pane, or catch a whiff of that rotten, sulfuric stench in the mountain air. That encounter shattered my understanding of the world, leaving me a haunted shell of my former self. The memory of that eyeless grin, the chilling emptiness where its eyes should be, still makes me shudder. What was it? Some unknown, nightmarish predator, or something, more? I'll never know. All I do know is that it's out there, lurking in the shadows. And maybe, just maybe, it's still waiting for me. My name is Everett and this happened to me in August of 2018. Holed up in a remote cabin outside Glacier National Park, figured after a few too many close calls overseas, a stint as a backcountry ranger would be a walk in the woods. Boy, was I wrong. Routine patrol turns interesting when I find torn fabric snagged on a branch near a semi-secluded trailhead. Bloodstains, too much to be a bear scuffle. Then there are the footprints, massive, mismatched, wrong, just, wrong. Whatever made them had a heavy tread and an uneven gait. Whatever it was, it was big, and likely injured. I radio it in. Headquarters tells me it's likely just a poacher and not to get my knickers in a twist. Figure they're right seemed too much to be truly rattled by some backwoods criminal. But something deep down, some old survival instinct, prickles me all wrong. Days bleed together. I track the prints, find half-devoured animal carcasses ripped apart with unnatural efficiency. They draw a ragged line deeper into the park, always away from the trails heading towards a high mountain basin locals call the Crow's Cradle. Never seen the place myself, but the old-timers whisper it's cursed, best left undisturbed. Now, I start to wonder if their tall tales carry a grain of truth. Finally, a break in the case. Find a campsite, looks like it was abandoned in a hurry. Gear is strewn about, tent shredded. Blood spatters everything, human this time for sure. 
A missing person report confirms my fears. Lone hiker named Jillian disappeared a few days back. Now I know this ain't no poacher. I also know time may well have run out for the woman. Call it in again, lay out the situation. This time they listen, send a whole damn task force, hunters, local volunteers with dogs. But I know what they won't. That ain't no man out there in those woods with Jillian. Instinct tells me I'm the only one with the experience, the sheer bloody-minded stubbornness to confront, whatever it is that dwells in the cradle. We reach the basin in the fading light. Place hits you wrong from the outset, a thick, unnatural silence, like even the insects are holding their breath. And it's cold, even in summer. Hunters spread out, their tracking dogs whining nervously, refusing to follow the scent trail. Something about this place spooks them, the same way it sets my own teeth on edge. Then, that smell. Rotting meat, sharp and stinging. We converge upon its source, a jumbled cleft in the rocks, half hidden by stunted pines. The men hesitate, glancing at me for orders. But I can no longer avoid the inevitable. With a grim nod, I'm the first one into the darkness, rifle at the ready. The fetid stench intensifies as I descend into the gloom. The rock face opens up into a cave, wide, damp, littered with gnawed bones that don't belong to any deer or wolf. And there, at the far end, illuminated by a sliver of fading sunlight, is Jillian. Or what's left of her. I'll spare you the details, but suffice to say she ain't long for this world. It becomes monstrously clear she was kept alive, a perverse act of either cruelty or some darker purpose. Beside her, half shrouded in shadow, is the creature. Impossibly tall, skeletal, with a twisted, skull-like head crowned by a pair of mismatched antlers dripping with black gore. Its skin stretches like old leather across jutting bone, draped in Jillian's shredded clothes. When it turns those burning pinprick eyes on me, I finally understand what the word inhuman truly means. The creature lets out a shriek, a chilling sound that seems to shake the very stones. Lunges towards Jillian, its razor-sharp claws extended. I don't hesitate, don't think just react. Raise my rifle and fire. The retort echoes like cannon fire in the cramped space. I empty the magazine into it, each shot tearing into its flesh, spraying inky fluid across the stone. It staggers, but it doesn't fall. Screams in rage, the sound echoing in my skull like a death knell. In the chaos, I catch a flicker of movement out of the corner of my eye. Jillian, mustering the last of her strength, is pushing something into my hands, her emergency beacon. She looks at me, the terror in her eyes tempered by a desperate, pleading. Hope. I can't save her from the monster, but maybe, just maybe, I can give her a shred of justice. The creature lunges at me, and I break for the cleft entrance, shoving the beacon deep into my pocket. Behind me, I hear another shriek, high and panicked as the monstrous silhouette blots out the last of the fading light. The scramble up that jagged cleft is a blur. Rocks crumble beneath my boots, my lungs burn. Can't look back, each ragged breath a prayer the creature won't follow. Behind me, I hear the monster scrabbling, its shrieks bouncing off the stone. It's big, but the space is tight, working in my favor, for now. I burst into the dying sunlight, gasping for clean air. It's a long drop down, but right now, broken bones seem preferable to what's behind me. I clamber over the edge just as a skeletal, 
clawed hand reaches up, swiping at empty air. The drop ain't graceful, but I land hard and roll, scrambling to my feet before the adrenaline fully wears off. I don't stop running until my lungs scream for mercy. Stumble into the search party's camp long after nightfall. Clothes are torn, face speckled in blood that ain't all mine. Delirious and babbling about monsters, I manage to gasp out one coherent thing, push the damn beacon button. The next few days are chaos. Evac helicopters swarm the basin like angry hornets. The mangled remains they recover from that cave defy every biology textbook. Jillian's body, mercifully, there isn't much left to find. Officially, her death is attributed to an animal attack, likely a rogue grizzly with a taste for human flesh. They quietly hunt it down and put it out of its misery. But the smarter ones among the rescue crew, the ones who saw the shredded tent and the monstrous footprints, they know better. They look at me with a new sort of wary respect, maybe a touch of fear. I don't tell them about the antlers, dripping with Jillian's lifeblood. About the eyes that burn with a chilling sentience that still haunts my nightmares. Those details vanish into the ether of official reports, replaced with sanitized terminology to soothe concerned taxpayers. The creature itself, it's never found. Wildlife experts are baffled, cryptozoology websites explode with speculation. But deep down, I know. It's out there, wounded, pissed off and biding its time in the shadowy heart of the cradle. The aftermath stretches long. I can't go back to the park service. Each rustle of wind, every snap of a twig is a potential death sentence. The quiet life I longed for, it's become a prison. I trade the cabin for a fifth-floor apartment overlooking a bustling city. Concrete jungle feels a hell of a lot safer than whispering woods. Still, they call sometimes, desperate park rangers dealing with disappearances, mutilated livestock. Hushed whispers of those same inhuman footprints, the lingering stench of decay, just like I found. When that phone rings, every fiber of my being wants to say to hell with it. But I also remember Jillian's eyes, the way she entrusted me with that final spark of defiance. So I find myself back on those trails once more, but this time with a grim posse of hardened hunters. We stalk the wilds, looking over our shoulders with every step. The men think we're tracking a rogue predator, they're half right. But it's something far more dangerous, far older that thrives in the cracks between the world we know and the one we desperately try to ignore. Some nights, lying awake in the sterile heart of the city, I can almost hear the crow's cradle calling my name. I see those burning eyes in the darkness. And I know that one day I won't just hear the call, I'll answer it. The hunt ain't over, not by a long shot. Out there in the wild places, the creature waits. And when it's ready, our paths will cross again. This time, it'll be the final showdown. Whether I'm the hunter or the prey, well, that's yet to be seen. My name is Jake, and this happened to me in August of 2012. I was living in an old cabin deep in the backwoods of the Ozark Mountains. Pretty remote. It was a peaceful life, if a little lonely. I spent my days hiking, fishing, and working in my garden. I had a little online business that kept me afloat, and I didn't need much else. One morning, I head out early. A couple from a nearby town contacted me about finding their cat, a prized Maine Coon that wandered off from their summer cottage. 
The last thing I want to do is go chasing some pampered house cat through the woods, but money's money and I take the job. I drive my rusty old truck down a winding dirt road. I park near their place and start looking for tracks or signs the cat had been around. It's hot and humid, the bugs buzzing thick in the air. After about an hour, I find something odd scratches high up on a tree trunk, far too high for any normal feline. They look deep, almost like claw marks from a big animal. That gets my attention. Suddenly, I hear a rustling in the bushes behind me. I tense up, reaching for the hunting knife on my belt. A scrawny ginger cat bursts out, eyes wide, and dashes off into the undergrowth. I chuckle to myself, relieved. Then again, that was one scared cat. I decide to follow the general direction the cat ran. About twenty yards in, I find, well, what's left of it. It's half-eaten, with the insides torn out like it was gutted by a wild beast. There's blood everywhere, the leaves of the bushes spattered crimson. That's definitely not a house cat's doing. A cold shiver runs down my spine. Something powerful, something dangerous, is out here. I try to radio the couple back at their cabin, but I get no signal. My phone is dead too, the reception out here is spotty at best. I'm alone, miles from any help. I have to find out what did this and get the hell out of here. I follow the trail of blood into a thicket of tangled bushes. My instincts scream at me to turn back, but my stubborn side takes over. The blood trail leads to a small cave opening, half concealed by rocks and vines. The stench wafting out is like rotten meat left in the sun. I creep closer, the rifle my father gave me gripped tight in my hands. It feels ridiculous out here in the woods, but suddenly I'm not so sure it is. The cave is shadowy, but I see movement in the darkness. A chill runs through me, my heart thudding in my chest. I raise the rifle, my finger on the trigger, and switch on the flashlight mounted beneath the barrel. The sudden glare of light in the cave makes the creature inside recoil. It hisses, a guttural, rasping sound that echoes in the stillness. Its eyes catch the light, glinting yellow in the darkness. I can see it now, a huge, gnarled body draped in patches of coarse fur. The limbs are long and powerful, the claws gleaming like sickles. Its head, it looks almost human but warped, twisted, the mouth an elongated maw of jagged teeth. This thing, whatever it is, is not natural. A primal surge of terror makes me react. I squeeze the trigger, the gunshot booming through the woods. The creature recoils, roaring something between a snarl and a scream. The bullet tore a chunk out of its shoulder, spraying the cave wall with black blood. It's injured, but still far from dead. It leaps towards me, faster than anything its size has a right to move. I fire again, the shot going wide as I duck for cover. My back slams hard against the rocky cave wall. My rifle is knocked from my grasp, clattering on the ground. The creature lunges, but its wounded shoulder throws it off. It scrambles for a moment, giving me a precious second. I snatch up the rifle and take aim again. It's too close too fast. I squeeze the trigger again just as it launches itself at me. The rifle blasts. The shot hits the creature square in the chest, tearing a hole through its rotting flesh. It howls, a sound filled with rage and pain, and stumbles backward. I'm on my feet, adrenaline coursing through me. I grab my knife, 
the one thing I have left, and back away from the cave mouth, keeping my eyes on the creature. It's still alive, hunched over, rasping breaths bubbling from its mangled chest. Despite its wound, there's still a flicker of terrible determination in its yellow eyes. I have to end this. Taking a deep breath, I rush forward, knife held high. The creature rears up, ready for another attack. I dodge its clawed hand, slashing at its legs with the knife. Thick black blood spills, and it lets out another blood-curdling scream. Stumbling on its wounded limbs, the creature turns to flee. It scrambles back into the cave, disappearing into the darkness. It's a gamble, but I have to follow. I squeeze into the cave opening, flashlight held out in front of me. The stench is overpowering, and the uneven walls of the cave are slick with blood. There are things in here, bones picked clean, strips of fur, and other unidentifiable remains. This creature has been living here for a while, preying on whatever it can catch. I hear a groan ahead, a wet, gurgling sound. I move towards it cautiously, the flashlight cutting a swathe through the darkness. The creature is lying on the ground, its breaths ragged and shallow. It's bleeding out, but I'm not taking chances. I raise the knife and with a swift, brutal strike, I end it. The creature goes still. I lean against the cave wall, panting, feeling sick to my stomach. I don't even want to think about what else might have been lurking in the shadows. It's time to leave this place. I make my way out of the cave, into the blinding afternoon sun. It takes every ounce of strength to move, to head back towards my truck. Back at my cabin, I burn the clothes I wore. I shower until my skin feels raw, trying to wash away the stink of that cave and the blood-soaked day. I try to sleep, but the nightmares keep me awake, a relentless loop of claws and teeth and burning eyes. The next morning, I drive to the nearest town and head straight to the sheriff's office. The whole story spills out of me, the missing cat, what I found in the woods, the creature. The sheriff, an older man with a face creased by years, listens. I can see the disbelief in his eyes, but he doesn't interrupt. When I finish, there's silence. He finally speaks, his voice laced with skepticism. Look, son, I know these woods pretty damn well. Never seen or heard anything like you describe. You sure you weren't just spooked by a bear or mountain lion? I want to argue, show in the photos I took on my phone, the dead cat, the cave, but it's dead now, the memory card wiped clean. Instead, I just nod, feeling deflated and alone. They never find a trace of that creature, of course. My story becomes the stuff of campfire tales, a crazy hermit's ramblings. But I know what I saw, and the nightmares never truly go away. I sell the cabin, leave the Ozarks, and never return. Sometimes, in the still of the night, I swear I can smell the rancid stench of that cave and hear those ragged, gurgling breaths. My name is Everett and this happened to me in October of 2010. Lived off-grid for the past decade or so in a remote cabin tucked way back in the Idaho wilderness. Folks call me a hermit, maybe they're right. Got my reasons for keeping a distance from the world, let's just say I ain't always been a stickler for the law. Work for the Forest Service, keeping an eye on the Selkirk Mountains. Mostly it's dealing with dumb tourists and the occasional poacher. Routine stuff, until the day the reports start rolling in. Sightings of something out there. 
descriptions are confused. Giant wolf some say, others swear it walks on two legs. Local tribes get spooked enough to send a delegation to the station, muttering warnings their ancestors whispered of long ago. I spend weeks patrolling those ancient woods, finding nothing but the usual tracks rangers back at base start giving me the side eye and the whispers follow me, old Ev's finally gone off the deep end. I start doubting myself too, until one evening, right as dusk paints the forest in shades of gray, I finally see it. Hulking silhouette at the edge of the treeline, all lean muscle and ragged fur. I freeze, rifle raised, but it doesn't move, it watches. There's an intelligence in those eyes that sends shivers down my spine. Not an animal. Before I can take a clean shot, it melts back into the shadows, leaving nothing but the soft pad of retreating footsteps and a lingering sense of unease. I report it, but nobody believes me. They think I'm seeing things, the stress of isolation finally getting to me. It gets worse. Each time I spot it, the encounters grow bolder. It circles my cabin at night, the sound of its claws scraping against the roof enough to keep me staring at the ceiling with my shotgun loaded. I find mutilated deer carcasses on my property, half-eaten, like it's leaving a grotesque message. Fear gnaws at my insides. This ain't a hunt anymore, it's personal. Then there's the day I come across Riley. Young Ranger, fresh out of the academy and stationed out here for his first assignment. Good kid, eager to make his mark. Somehow, he caught wind of my reports, the ones they tried to keep quiet. He found me at the edge of the woods, eyes wide and filled with something akin to hero worship. Mr. Walker, I believe you, he said his voice barely above a whisper. Saw something out there myself, can't explain it. We gotta stop it. So, there we are, a grizzled old loner and a green behind the ears rookie, staking out my cabin and hoping for a fight. The night stretches long and silent. Riley twitches with every rustling leaf, while I try to hide my mounting dread. Maybe this whole thing was a mistake. Maybe I should have kept him out of it. Then it comes. Not from the shadows this time, but straight out of the woods in a burst of motion. The creature barrels towards us, a horrifying silhouette against the moonlight. It's bigger than I thought, easily eight feet tall, built with a wiry, lethal strength. Its eyes glow an unnatural yellow in the dark, and its gaping maw reveals rows of sharp-looking teeth. Riley raises his rifle, his hands shaking. What, what the hell is that, he stammers. I shoulder my own weapon. Best guess? Something old, something hungry, and something that ain't supposed to be here. The creature charges. I fire, and Riley follows suit. Our bullets find their mark, ripping into its flesh. It howls, a sound both furious and filled with pain. Black blood sprays the ground, but it keeps coming. Riley shrieks as the creature swipes at him, a clawed hand slashing across his torso. He goes down, his uniform blossoming with crimson. Rage surges through me, hot and primal. Ron, kid. I yell, not sure whether it's an order or a plea. There's no time to see if he follows it. I have to distract the creature, buy him time. I level my shotgun, firing again and again. The recoil jars my shoulder, but the creature finally falters, stumbles. Seizing my chance, I turn and sprint into the trees, the guttural snarls of the creature echoing behind me. 
I don't stop running until my lungs burn and my legs threaten to give out. Only then do I risk a glance back. The woods are silent, bathed in the soft glow of dawn that's starting to break. Did I lose it? Did it? The silence hangs heavy, broken only by my ragged breaths. I inch forward cautiously, rifle at the ready. The adrenaline coursing through me fights against the bone-deep weariness. How much longer can I keep this up? A flicker of movement above makes me jerk my head up. There, perched on a massive pine branch, is the creature. It's wounded, leaking black ichor from the bullet holes, yet its eyes blaze with an even brighter hunger. We stare at each other, predator and prey, bound in a deadly dance. Then, it leaps. I barely have time to dive to the side as it lands where I stood a split second ago, claws tearing gouges in the earth. It pivots with unnatural speed, a snarl contorting its monstrous face. Desperation fuels me. I charge forward, not towards escape, but straight at the creature. I slam the butt of my rifle into its injured shoulder, and it shrieks, a sound that makes the hair on my neck stand on end. The move gives me a split second, just enough to level the gun in its chest and fire. The blast echoes through the silent forest, and the creature staggers backward. Not dead, goddammit, but hurt badly. It eyes me warily, seeming to weigh its options. Then, with a last guttural growl, it turns and vanishes into the dense undergrowth. I collapse onto the damp earth, my whole body trembling. Did I survive? Is it over? My name is Jacob Willis, and this happened to me in September 2011. I live off the grid have for years now. It's peaceful, lets me keep my head clear, you know? That year I got some contract work with the Forest Service in Idaho. Nothing fancy, just trail maintenance and a little bit of hazard clearing. Start of September, I'm packing out for a three-day stretch up near the Selway River. Deep wilderness, that. I'm not the superstitious type but something about those woods gave me the pricklies. Something, old. First day up there, everything goes normal. Hard labor up steep hillsides, but that's the gig. Second morning, I head out further in. That old forest unease starts creeping back. I push it off, need to get this work done. About midday, I come across a section, old wildfire damage maybe, and it's awful. Scorched pines littering the ground like matchsticks. There's this, rank smell. Nothing rotting, more like sulfur. Whatever. I start an on clearing a path. That's when I hear it. Crack of branches, right behind me. I whirl around. Nothing. Chalk it up to jumpiness, I've been alone too long, maybe. Back to work. I hear it again, further off. This time, a glimpse. Tall figure, moving fast, between the trees. I shout, hey! Who's there? No answer. Adrenaline surges. I hike out, fast, keeping an eye on the tree lean. Get back to camp, nothing seems amiss. Night falls. The unease grows. Every rustle, every twig snap, feels unnatural. I swear I see movement in the shadows. It sets me on edge. I try to sleep, but it's useless. It's watching. Next morning, my gear's been messed with. Food bags torn open, 
water bottles drained. My mind races, a bear wouldn't do that. But something else, something smarter. I see a smear of something on a boulder, thick and dark. I don't recognize it. I'm too rattled to work, something's out there, and it's not good. I break camp and hike for the trailhead, but I know I'm not alone. Half a mile down, I smell that sulfur stench again. I spin around, and there it is. On the ridge, watching me. It stands nearly eight feet tall, lean, but not human. Its skin is a dark, mottled gray, with patches of hair, like a diseased hide. But its eyes are the worst, huge, yellow, unblinking. It hunches over, not quite animal, not quite man. My heart pounds in my chest. I raise my rifle, fingers shaking on the trigger. The thing stares at me, intelligent. A sense of pure dread washes over me. My hands freeze. Then it turns and slips back into the trees. I watch the spot where it disappeared, then run. I don't know what I'm dealing with, but I know I don't want to find out. I burst onto the trailhead, a blur of exhausted panic. A few hikers look at me funny, but I don't care. I drive all evening, put Idaho behind me. I never went back, never reported a thing. People would call me crazy, but who's to say they were wrong? A while later, I'm at a bar in Wyoming, trying to drink away the memory, when I see the news. Missing hiker near the Selway. Same area I was in. They never found the guy. Sometimes at night, I see those yellow eyes in the dark and wonder if he was luckier than me. I tell myself it was some freak of the woods, something undiscovered perhaps. But a cold, sinking feeling tells me otherwise. Something old exists out there and I was lucky enough to get a glance. A couple of months later, I'm down near Sequoia National Park. I'm on a logging crew now, trying to lay low. One of the old timers, guy named Zeke, he pulls me aside. You heard about Ed? He asks, voice low. Ed who? I reply, playing dumb. Ed from the trail crew went missing two weeks back. They say, animal attack. Messy. Zeke's eyes have that knowing look in them. The dread crawls up my spine, the cold certainty. It's found a new territory. I quit that crew the next day, never looked back. For the last few years, I've been drifting. Job to job place to place, never stopping long, never using my real name. Every now and then, I'll hear a story. Missing person, animal attack they can't explain. Same general areas, national parks, deep backwoods. The descriptions always get me, the sulfur smell, the messed up camp, that feeling of being watched. I try not to think about how many others are out there, how many saw those yellow eyes and didn't live to tell about it. It's my turn next, I know it. It's only a matter of time. My name is Lucas, and this happened to me in September of 2013. I was working as a wilderness survey technician in the Olympic National Forest, Washington State. It's a hiker's paradise, but most folks stick to the manicured trails me. I've always been drawn to the ancient parts, the moss-covered old growth with its tangled canopy overhead. Figure a man can find peace there, even if his past ain't exactly peaceful. It starts subtly. A gnawed carcass way too high in a tree for a cougar. 
strange rustling sounds that don't match any critter I know. It culminates one evening when I see the track's massive, misshapen footprints pressed deep into the mud near my campsite, looking more human than animal, yet elongated, clawed. A deep unease crawls under my skin, the kind that says you're being watched. I radio back to base camp, try to play it cool. They tell me it's likely a bear, nothing to worry about. The voice on the other end can't mask her hesitation, though. I've heard enough old-timers whispers about things that walk the deep woods to know there's more out here than the guidebooks admit. A couple of days later, the doubts vanish. I'm deep in the whole rainforest, the light barely filtering through the thick canopy overhead. That's when I see it, crouched behind a cluster of sword ferns. Ragged fur barely covers a skeletal frame, its movements jittery and unnaturally fast. Then, its head snaps up, locking onto me. It's a face pulled straight from a nightmare. Skull-like with shrunken skin stretched taut. The eyes are milky white, blind and yet impossibly seeing. But it's the jaw, wide and unhinged, filled with rows of needle-sharp teeth that makes me stumble back in horror. It lets out a screech that vibrates through my bones, both a threat and a hunger cry. My brain scrambles for solutions, run, hide, climb, all useless against whatever this thing is. I fumble for the pistol on my hip. It's a big caliber, meant for putting down injured elk or scaring off grizzlies. Against this, I don't give myself good odds. The creature lunges, blurringly fast. I squeeze off a shot, more out of desperation than hope. It shrieks, the sound laced with surprise and pain. Blackish blood spurts from its shoulder, but it doesn't fall. It scrambles backward, those empty eyes fixed on me, and for a second, I see something like, calculation? But then, an answering screech echoes through the forest, cutting off my muddled thoughts. I'm not alone out here. There's more than one. Another blurred shape bursts from the undergrowth, then another. Three hulking forms circle me like wolves surrounding cornered prey. My shots ring out until the pistol clicks empty. One of the creatures shrieks and collapses, a spray of inky gore staining the green undergrowth. It's not enough. They close in, the air thick with their fetid musk and guttural growls. I barely register the pain when a clawed hand rakes across my chest, sending me tumbling to the damp forest floor. Hot blood seeps through my shirt. Through my blurred vision, I see one of them crouch over the dead creature, tearing into its flesh with unnatural speed. They're not just predators. They devour their own. Then, a noise cuts through their snarling feast, the crunch of boots on gravel. A shout echoes through the dense forest, familiar and laced with fury. Hold on, Lucas. It's Caden, a fellow ranger who's been tracking local bear sightings. He must have heard the gunshots and come running. He emerges from the trees, rifle raised. The creatures freeze, then scatter with eerie coordination, vanishing into the tangled undergrowth. Caden rushes over, dropping to his knees beside me. Damn it. Man, you okay? Talk to me. I manage a weak cough in response, tasting blood. Gonna be alright, Caden whispers fiercely, though whether it's meant for me or himself, I'm not sure. He expertly dresses my wounds, the whole time cursing himself for not getting there sooner. His eyes hold a haunted look now. That carefree... Big grinning guy I knew is gone. We don't speak much as we hike out, 
an unspoken understanding hanging heavy between us. As the ranger station comes into view, a wave of exhaustion washes over me. But there's no relief. The forest, once my haven, now teems with unseen horrors. Later, in the cramped medical room, the incident report labels it a bear attack. Caden and I stare at each other across the table. There are some truths you can't put down on paper, especially when the reality of them could shatter your whole damn world. My name is Thomas, and this happened to me in September 2006. I work off the grid in a remote cabin in the vast forests of Montana. I love the peace, the solitude, and the opportunity to truly connect with the rhythms of nature. It might sound cliché, but I came here searching for something deeper, something more meaningful than the relentless grind of city life. The incident started on a crisp morning, the air tinged with the early hints of autumn. I had a job to do for a client, tracking an animal that was reported to be killing livestock near a ranch several miles north. My experience and skills made me the right guy for these types of missions. I pack everything I need, gear, supplies, a rifle, just in case. The hike takes me a couple of hours over rough terrain. The landscape here is dramatic, deep ravines, craggy rock formations, dense stands of pine. I follow tracks left by the mystery animal. They are big, far larger than any wolf or mountain lion. The sun hangs high in the sky. I find the first carcass near a creek bed. It's a calf, and the way it's been torn open, there's nothing natural about this. Bones are shattered, flesh is ripped in brutal gashes. I've seen predator kills before, but this is different. A feeling starts creeping up, a primal sense of unease. The trail of the creature leads farther into the woods. The tracks become erratic, almost as if the animal is wounded. There's a lingering scent, a mix of earth, musk, and something acrid that makes the hair on the back of my neck stand up. And then, ahead of me, I see a massive shape moving through the trees. My heart pounds in my chest. I crouch low, using the underbrush for cover. It's huge, bigger than any bear I've ever seen, with long, powerful limbs. Its fur is dark, matted, and its movements twitchy. I raise the rifle, trying to steady my breathing. The creature is still partially obscured, but there's something else, something far more unsettling. It looks bipedal, like it's walking on two legs. As it moves out of the shadows, I realize what I'm seeing, and the shock hits me like a fist. It looks almost human, but twisted and disfigured. Its head is elongated, the jaw jutting out unnaturally. The eyes are yellow, burning with a feral intensity. Its claws are long, curved and stained with what I can only assume is blood. The stench of decay and raw meat is almost overwhelming. And that's when it sees me. It lets out a chilling roar, a guttural, bestial sound that sends a shiver down my spine. I fire the rifle, the recoil kicking against my shoulder. The creature staggers, but the shot doesn't appear to do much damage. It charges straight toward me, its speed astonishing. I drop the rifle and run. Blindly, desperately. Every instinct screams at me to get out of there, to escape this nightmare. Branches tear at my clothes, whipping my face. I feel its breath hot on my neck, the fetid stench making me gag. The ground drops away in front of me, a hidden ravine. I fall, tumbling down the rocky slope. I hit the bottom hard, 
my vision blurring. Above me, I can hear it scrambling, searching for a way down. Pain surges through my body, but I force myself to move, crawling deeper into the shadows of the ravine. I lose track of time. Maybe it's minutes, maybe hours. Finally, I risk a glance back. The ravine curves, and whatever that thing was, it's out of sight. I'm battered and bruised, but alive. I drag myself further down the ravine, eventually stumbling onto a well-worn path. I have no idea where it leads, but it's my only option. As the sun sinks below the horizon, I reach a logging road and follow it for hours. Finally, lights appear in the distance. It's a small town, and I limp toward the first building I see, a dimly lit diner. I burst through the door, collapsing onto a stool. The locals stare at me, disheveled, covered in dirt and blood, eyes wide with a mix of terror and exhaustion. I order a coffee, a burger, anything to ground myself. When the waitress asks if I'm okay, I start talking. I tell them everything, about the job, the creature, the chase. Their expressions range from disbelief to outright pity. Clearly, they think I'm either crazy or spinning a wild yarn fueled by moonshine. I don't blame them, it sounds insane, even to my own ears. But, what I saw out there, it was real, 